Welcome, everyone. I'm calling this meeting to order. This is a joint city council and cultural commission meeting. Uh, city clerk, is there a roll call or confirmation of a quorum? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I am confirming a confirmation of, a, of the quorum. All right, very good. We're confirmed. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. It's so nice and exciting to see our cultural commission, our fun commission here in the city of Santa Clara. You provide us with a lot of great activities during the year. We're going to start going around the table here to introduce ourselves. I'm Lisa Gilmore, Mayor. Raj Chahal, uh, Council Member District 2. Kathy Watanabe, District 1, and uh, happy to have those two great concerts last summer. I'm Kevin Park from the Best District, District 4. I'm Paul McNamara, Commissioner. John Marinero, Commissioner. Oh, can you turn that on? Sometimes it turns, it's Nito the Gark, Commissioner. Luis Samara, Commissioner. Deborah Von Heeren, Vice Chair. Uh, Candida Diaz, Chair. Kim Castro, Recreation Manager. Susan Diotti, Recreation Supervisor. Tyler Freitas, Recreation Coordinator. One more, now. Hi, I'm Cynthia Bohercus. <laughs> Assistant City Manager, Acting Director of Parks and Recreation. Brian Guggen, City Attorney. Devon Grogan, City Manager, and I know how to make this thing go home. <laughs> red means go. Green no, means go here, and your red means go. <laughs> Anthony Becker, Council Member, District 6. Karen Hardy, District Council Member, District 3. Said Jane, District 5, I heard a nasty rumor you're going to move the street dance. Anyways, welcome everyone. So um, we'll start with, uh, we, we, I know you have a lot to report to us and we have a lot to talk about. So um, Chair Diaz, if you'd like to start. Perfect. Well, thank you. First off, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to meet with you. It's wonderful to see you. We haven't met in a dinner session since how many years? Four years? It's been a, it's been a while. Yeah. yeah. So it's very nice to see you all. Um, and let me start with our presentation. Can we? Sorry. Perfect. All righty. Well, thank you. Move down. Okay, so let's start off with our 2023 accomplishments. So the first thing is our concert series, our concerts in the park. And yes, uh, Kathy, we had two wonderful concerts in the north side. We started off, or we had our second uh, concert in the north side with the Fog City Swampers, and then we had our last concert for the series in the north side as well with the Mega the Megatones at Live Oak Park. Um, it was unfortunate that just for those two concerts, the weather was kind of iffy, um, but there still was a great turnout. So we had a wonderful turnout at all of our concerts. It was great to see our council members who attended uh, the community. We had a great... Um, uh, Oh my gosh, now I'm lost for words. We had great celebrations, lots of people, lots of dancing. Uh, the feedback was wonderful from our concert. So uh, again, it was a great series. And I have to uh, give our thanks to our city staff um, who do so much work in order to make those happen. But they are a lot of fun. And thank you so much for everything that you do for us. I have to get that in there before I forget. Um, so we have some great pictures here, and um, our city staff, uh, Mr. Freitas, has been great at posting all of these on social media, lots of videos, so it's been a wonderful experience. Um, also, our street dance, uh, I think, has been, was this year was the largest attendance that we've had at the street dance, and you could tell when you were there, and the amount of people, the chairs, uh, the atmosphere was great. We had wonderful sponsors, food trucks. We had the library bookmobile. We had so many people there, and they were so happy to be there. Uh, it was a wonderful community celebration, and um, it was a lot of fun. We have our picture here with our uh, city council and with the band, the Pop Rocks. So we're very much looking forward to our next uh, street dance, and I will get to you, um, uh, Councilmember Jane, on our proposal for this next year. 
Uh, the next thing is our home decorating contest, and we're going to start off with our Halloween 2023. Again, we had some wonderful submissions, and I'm highlighting here the winners for each of the districts. On this page, we have District 1 on Billing Circle, District 2 on Keith Lane, and then we have District 3 on Noble Lee Avenue. On our next page, we have District 4 on Pepper Tree Lane, and unfortunately, we didn't have any submissions from District 5, but from District 6, we had uh, Doug Lane Avenue. And our best of the best this year was at 109 Herald Avenue. A wonderful, beautiful uh, Halloween uh, decorating. And these uh, houses are all listed on a map, which are posted to our social media so that our residents, our community members, can travel and view these uh, submissions of the houses who are um, submitting to our Halloween uh, home decorating contest. So it was great. The next thing is our commemorative coloring pages. We have been fortunate to contract with an artist uh, to create these, and her name is Giada Conte. And if you recognize her name, she actually completed one of our utility boxes um, for us in our last round. So she's a wonderful artist, and so she was helping us with these commemorative coloring pages. We release these every month, and thank you to our Commissioner Von Heun, who posts these on our social media. They also are posted in City Hall News so that our community can see these. Uh, we encourage them to color them and then to post them on our pages so that we can publicize those. These are the last three months. We have January with our National Staying Healthy Month, February African American History Month, and we have March with Women's History Month. So these are posted right on or about the first of every month. And uh, our next one for April is Jazz Appreciation and Nat National Poetry Month. And then May, South Asian and Asian Pacific Heritage. So we're uh, making sure that we're putting out this information. And again, the fun coloring pages are well received by especially our young community members. And then our home decorating contest. This is our hol holiday uh, decorating contest. And here are our winners. Uh, District 1 on Burdick Lane. District 2 on Hoover Court. And then District 3 on Santa Maria Avenue. And I have to say that for this particular home decorating contest, we implemented a slightly different process. We wanted to go out to the community because we see a lot of people decorating their homes at Halloween and at Christmas, and they haven't been submitting into our contest. So what um, our commission decided to do was to implement home visits. So if you see a house that's decorated within your community, you would go out, leave a leaflet, uh, telling them about our holiday home decorating contest uh, in order to market and to get the word out so that they would be willing uh, to submit their house into our contest. So we did, as a result of that, get a lot more interest in the program, and we had a lot more submissions. Here is the winner for District 4 on Capitola Way and District 5, Lincoln Street. And I'll just make a note that District 5 hadn't had any submissions to our contest in the last four competitions. And as a result of this marketing to the homeowners, we actually did. And they, for this contest, was the second highest submissions for this uh, particular contest. So it was great. The marketing worked. And thank you to our uh, commissioners who were doing that and going out into the community and um, reaching out to those homeowners. Uh, District 5 was on Lincoln Street, and District 6 was on, six was on Sloat Court. And then our best of the best was at 875 Pepper Tree Lane in Santa Clara. So again, this was very well received. We had great comments on social media. Everyone was saying how much they loved it. And again, the uh, map was posted online for our community members to go out and visit these homes. The next thing is our temporary art installation, and this is a picture of the mechanical horse by artist Adrian Landon, and this was uh, installed at Santa Clara University, so this is a partnership between the Cultural Commission, the City of Santa Clara, and Santa Clara University, and thank you again to our Commissioner Von Heun for all of the work that she did in order to make this happen. So she met with the artist, she really facilitated this entire installation. Um, again, the partnership with Santa Clara was a wonderful thing. Uh, I know that Many of you were there at the celebration of the installation. It was in a wonderful location in the brand new um, building on the university campus. And it was wonderful because it is a horse and Santa Clara's the Broncos. Yay, Broncos, I'm alumni. Um, so it, uh, the community uh, loved this installation. It was so beautifully placed here with the lights and everything. And I know I saw many of you pressing the button to get it going and turning on. So it was a lot of fun. 
Um, as a result of this particular installation, uh, the university was able to obtain a corporate sponsor uh, for the robotics lab. And so they actually had their own competition on campus, a kinetic art challenge, where they had some engineering students be able to submit um, their work. So it's kind of meshing between the engineering, the tech, with the arts. So that was a wonderful kind of offshoot as a result of this art installation. So we're seeing now um, the fruits of these kinds of installations within the community. So that was wonderful. Um, for that uh, Kinetic Art Challenge, the first place winner, because of the corporate sponsor, they actually won $2,500. And so, um, yeah, that was great. So wonderful. Thank you again, uh, Commissioner Von Heun. So I have a quick thing. I don't know if I can. Can I stop and ask uh, what feedback did the council members get for this particular arts installation? Did you hear from your constituents about this particular thing? I got a lot of feedback from that. Um, the, really a lot of interest. I sent a ton of people over. I put it on my social media. But I sent people over to go look at it. People that brought their families, smaller children that just wanted to press that button. I didn't know if the actual, if, if the horse made it through with all the button pressing, did it, did it survive? <laughs> but people loved it, and if we have more of these, they're super interested. I think we really have to get it out there that it's available for them, for anybody in the public to see, because people that, I, at least the ones I talked to, were shocked that they could just go over there and, do the, and bring their children and, and see it and watch it. It's fascinating for some reason. I pushed, pushed it several times just to watch it. It was... Super fascinating, but I was hoping we'd get the big one over here, and um, that's what I'm waiting for Commissioner Von Heun to tell me that we're getting a big horse over here. Right. Anyways, is that later on in the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi. Well, I also uh, talked to a lot of students and told them about the horse. In fact, I had several meetings with students at the university, and they didn't know that it was there. And it's kind of cool because even without the button, it looks pretty cool. It looks really nice even without the button. Mm -hmm. And so I said, no, 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 you've got to go inside and you've got to, you've got to push the button. And the pushing the button made it like, it was like from zero, zero to 60. It was just even cooler. But I think that that's the great, great thing about this piece, which is even not in motion, even if you don't know what it can do, it looks amazing. And then when you can see what it does, you're even more amazed. Yes. And they were like, oh my goodness, we're so glad we met you here. Because they were on campus and they didn't know. And I sent a lot of other people down uh, uh, to there as well, but I don't know what they thought, but I'll ask them. Well, that's pretty amazing because I'm still on the school mailing list, and they sent out a lot of emails about that. So I'm hoping that a lot of students were able to get make it down there and see it because it was beautiful. Uh, the next thing is our sculpt sculpture exhibition, and the theme for this year is One World, One Hope. For this, I don't know if you've noticed on social media, we did extend the submission period for this, uh, so the call for artists is still currently open. Uh, the prizes for this particular exhibition, first place, we are awarding $2,500, second place, $1,500, and then third place is $750. Uh, the, we are able in this, as part of this exhibition, to feature up to 25 artists' artwork uh, to be installed at designated locations, and those are mostly at our public libraries, and then also we're hoping to be able to install one here at City Hall, so that's pretty exciting. In May, the exhibition opens to the public, and there will be public online voting available for our community. And then in June, the plan is that all artists who submit to the exhibition are invited to reception, and the first, second, and third place winners will be announced, so we'll kind of have a little uh, shindig and, you know, have a fun community event. Uh, so again, the call for artists are open right now, so What's we are... What's the deadline extended to, may I ask? Because I put this out also on my social media, yeah. but I, I want to put that it's extended to what? It's this Sunday. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So we're hoping uh, uh, that we get a lot of great submissions for this so that we can then feature those within the community, so that'll be a lot of fun. Looking forward to our 2024 concert series. So here is the lineup, and then we also have flyers. Oh, I don't know if everyone got them. 
and they're out there on the table. So we have our new flyers out for this concert series. The first one is going to be on the north side at Live Oak Park with the House Rockers, the rock and roll um, uh, music and dancing. And then the arrest are at Central Park on the 28th, the Peelers, the July 1st, the Megatones, July 26th, uh, we have Latin um, salsa music. August 16th, we have uh, the Pop Fiction with Ultimate Dance Party. So we're really looking forward to our next concert series. I hope to see you all there. And then for 2024 Street Dance, we have the band uh, Neon Velvet, who's going to be performing at the Street Dance. And it will be taking place on Friday, August 2nd, from 6 to 9.30. In response to your uh, comment about moving locations. So I mentioned that this past year was, I think, our most highly attended uh, dance, street dance that we've had in a while. And it was very tight. And so what we're doing and what we've been looking at is moving the location for the street dance just down the way, not very far, on Franklin Street. So we have been fortunate that our city staff has been supporting us in scoping out the location. So if you're familiar with the Parade of Champions, it would be where the village was located. So we're not blocking Monroe Street. So it's in order to keep Monroe open and the back of the stage would back to Monroe Street. So it would face down Franklin so that then we could have the stage there on the, the intersection of Monroe and Franklin facing the 7-Eleven side. Uh, and then we would have all of our uh, space, a lot more space for people to move out, to set up their lawn chairs. Also to have space for food trucks lining the driveways and we're trying to figure out how we're gonna be exactly laying those out. And it would extend down that way towards the 7-Eleven. So we're hoping that with the increased room, we could facilitate, you know, accommodate more uh, community members there, more room for dancing, because that's really what they're looking for as well, um, and then have room for the food trucks and all of the other people that we're going to invite to the street dance. So that is the plan so far. We're in the works. We are planning, but it looks good based on the scoping uh, by our city staff, but more than likely it is going to be moving there. So not far, um, but we're hoping this will be a great change to the street dance to accommodate more people. I, I would like you to consider closing Monroe Street um, and then it connects it to the mall like it does in the Parade of Champions uh, for safety reasons as well. People running all over the place. I don't know. It just seems to me that that would be a, a safer way to accommodate people and then they can incorporate back into the mall too back and forth. I don't, that, I, it's a suggestion. I like yeah. the way the Parade of Champions does it. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can definitely discuss that more at our next meeting and then, of course, consult with city staff to see how we could make that happen. Um, but again, the idea is to be able to accommodate more people and ha be able to have them come and participate and be comfortable because we felt very tight. Yeah, at this last year's dance. So, which is a good thing. People want to come out. They want to attend. And um, I was even kind of bugging city staff to see if there's any way we could do a second street dance. But it's a lot. It's a lot of work to get that going. But the reception that we've gotten, the positive reception from the community, I think they would love to have another one. So... Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a lot of work though. So um, we're maybe gearing up, but let's see what the location change looks like, how it works, and then maybe we'll see based on funds that we get from city council on what we can do going forward, but yeah. Beginning so. of summer and end of summer. That would be wonderful, right? Great. Yeah. One in the middle. Okay, <laughs> we, yeah, I see you. So we'll, we'll see what we can do, but the street dance is so much fun. So we're of course looking forward to seeing you all there on August 2nd. As far as any future projects that we have, we are looking again to restart Friday Night Live. It's been a few years since we've done this because of COVID. Uh, so we're looking at introducing the series again uh, fall of this year. So we're currently working on that uh, as a commission. Uh, the Utility Box Art Program, which I love, I, I have been doing this the last couple rounds. We're hoping, again, to restart that in, uh, in 2025. It's kind of hard. We can only do one major kind of event, and we're doing the sculpture exhibition this year. So next year, uh, we'll be able to do the uh, Utility art, uh, Box Art Program. And with this next round, we're hoping to uh, create a partnership with our local school communities and see how we can get some of our high school students in particular involved with decorating some of these utility boxes. So we'll see how that goes. We're going to try something a little bit different um, in order to um, get our young people involved with the program. 
Uh, the next is the support for our citywide arts master plan. I know many of you have heard from several of our commissioners about that, and we are very enthusiastic to get that going. Um, we are happy to provide any input, any support that you need in order, and we've been thankful to have our assistant city manager help and come talk to us as a commission about what we would need to do, the steps in order to get that going. So we are happy uh, to have that progress. And um, if you need anything from us, I know that there are several very enthusiastic uh, uh, commissioners who would love to help and get that going. And then finally, we have been in discussion with Mission College for a potential event collaboration. They have great spaces, and if you've noticed, they have been uh, marketing, publicizing, and holding concerts on Mission College. And because they are here within our community and they are having concurrent concerts, uh, we are looking at ways that we can work together with Mission College in order to have joint concerts to promote again across our platforms and to get more things, events happening within the Santa Clara community. Um, so we're looking at, uh, we're in talks right now and looking at rolling something out for with Mission College for our next year for our concert series. So that's a little bit of change for us. I think we're at the end of our presentation. I don't know if anyone has anything to add or if you have any questions. Commissioners, and we'll go, we'll each get a chance to say something, but this is your show, so. Well, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and address the question about having more um, large public art. Um, I know that there was a lot of interest in another piece by the artist Adrian Landon, and I talked to the Triton Museum. They think it would be an ideal place to make an installation such as of the Pegasus, but um, we've not been able to progress because we don't have funding for that. We either need major corporate sponsorship or uh, a larger budget for the Cultural Commission. So that's something that perhaps we can talk about in priority setting. And uh, I know last time I came in front of the council and talked about whether you know we could make some progress on um, new revenue streams, such as um, or, or anything that would come as a result of the Arts Master Plan, any kind of funding um, that would come from you know, TOT or 1% uh, for the arts, anything like that that could increase our budget and, and give us a bit of an endowment to make some um, larger moves in public art. What is the cost of, for instance, placing Pegasus just for our, a ballpark figure to uh, do something like that? That was like going to be $25,000. Well, that would be for six months. Reachable. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, to, I guess, piggyback a little bit on that. I uh, want to thank, actually, Cynthia for the work that she's been doing with us on getting the Art Master Plan moving forward. I know I personally had been annoying <laughs> about this, but um, outside of that, uh, we've really been working hard at getting this moving forward because we understand, especially city finances wide, being able to understand those or be able to at least apply for those external funding sources and be able to utilize that might take might allow us to do far more and take a bit more of the uh, burden off of you with regards to that. So we're working hard on that, on those processes and uh, developing that. And so I want to thank Cynthia again for kind of helping guiding us forward on this, especially given her experience with it with Sunnyvale. So, um, And then secondly, to that point, uh, the work with Mission College, uh, they are very eager to go and have us work with them to do possibly a first uh, day of school concert there. Um, we weren't able to align our resources this year because of schedules, et cetera, but uh, I think we are looking to plan to set up something with them next year so that both us and them can work on something that would be about the scale of the street dance, but with work and you know everything kind of shared between us and Mission College, which should be a, uh, a bit less of a burden, hopefully, on our staff. So. Yeah, that's a thank you. Uh, in terms of um, create, getting more activities going, uh, we're planning to bring back the Friday Night Live, and that uh, we were not able to have mm -hmm. for obvious reasons in during COVID uh, era. <clears throat> and you know, we use those to outreach a specific uh, members or specific uh, ethnicities or. Uh, just bring more activities to, to the city. Uh, we're trying to target 
different levels, not just, uh, you know, high school, Candy that I mentioned, uh, reaching out to the high school students. And uh, we're going to be uh, looking into different programming to bring more uh, students, students bring parents and relatives and, uh, and you know, the, the city benefits. So, you know, we're, we understand that when we have a full lineup of concerts, uh, that we have a full lineup of uh, Friday night live events. Uh, I think when we first moved over to uh, Parks and Recs, we had about 14 to 15 events that we planned throughout the year. And that is taxing, right? Uh, we, we, we work with staff to you know, streamline things, to get smarter, to uh, get our, our contracts in place. Uh, usually it takes some time to work through things. Uh, several uh, months uh, work to contracts and you know it, 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 it took time to get into the habit of you know planning three nothing less than three months uh, from <clears throat> you know concept to execution right it's just not realizable but you know it's uh, it does take us anywhere between six months to a year uh, to bring you know new programming new, new ventures it, It'd be great to have two street dance. It's just uh, challenging, but it's something that we want to challenge. You know, I, I remember working uh, with everybody to bring the second or to bring uh, back a concert to the north side, right? It took us uh, a couple of years, but, you know, it was, you know, well received. And, you know, we want to do more uh, in terms of uh, the visibility that we get from um, Mission College. They know the weather. You know, they know what, you know, we deal with, you know, and... I work in that area for quite a few years, and I have forgotten how quickly the weather changes in the afternoons and, and the weather pattern. So it would it, be great to, to work with them to uh, line up events, you know, to be able to share and, you know, have different events throughout the year. So, I, you know, I, it's always surprising how much coordination goes and how much staff actually does for us. Uh, Know, they, they really do a great job, and you know the commissioners. Uh, we we all do this uh, on a volunteer basis, and you know we all pull our strengths. Uh, we try different things. Uh, we uh, develop new skills. You know, in bringing all these ac activities, which take a lot of planning in the background. So, you know, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your support, and you know, thank you, staff, for always uh, coming through. It's a, it really is a. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Lewis. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah, just I just want to plant a seed for arts education. We recently made it a priority for the commission, and right now I'm leading that effort, and we're in an exploratory mode on what that actually means. Uh, it turns out that the Santa Clara Unified just came up with a master plan for arts education because of Prop 28. And if you don't know what Prop 28 is, it's a billion dollars a year for the state of California for arts education. So they're looking for ways on how to apply that in terms of hiring more arts teachers. And so uh, Kim and I attended a meeting with uh, the uh, Superintendent Waddell and um, a number of different folks from the community um, to just talk about what that might look like and so uh, we would obviously want to add that to the arts master plan because it, it seems that the, to have a creative force, I mean, this valley is known worldwide as being the most creative uh, on the planet, and we can see the economic impact uh, from that. I think NVIDIA is a perfect example of that. Um, the AI, uh, they started as a the gaming software that made NVIDIA possible, it came from gaming online gaming, and uh, that started in 1998. And it turns out that they, they can use that same software for machine learning and artificial intelligence. That's why they're the leader right now, far above Intel, far above anybody else on the planet. So, um, but, but all of that creativity starts very, very young. And the capacity for kids, critical thinking, I mean, you name it. So. We're presently going to do a gap analysis with uh, Santa Clara Unified to figure out what that was a professional fundraiser. I worked at San Jose State for for 20 years, and so I'm looking for a specific way that we can find as uh, uh, 
Campbell has done in other municipalities, you know, around the arts, or is that out yet? And it's coming. <laughs> Create a foundation. <laughs> Create a foundation. I'm like pretty new to the commission, but uh, so far I'm enjoying it. And uh, people ask me, okay. Oh, very good. And I saw you at a lot of events, so you really jumped into your job. <laughs> um, I'll just start and then we'll go down the path here um, so all council members can give their comments. Um, I, a couple things. One, I know in the past that we recognize it's the contest winners at City Hall for. I'm trying to remember the last time we did that. I don't think we did it this season. So I know it was something that the contest winners like, really enjoyed having, and they brought their families, and they're proud of showing. So I'd like to see that come back again, you know, as an, as an opportunity. And then it, it also announces to the community that this contest does exist and to be a part of it, because I think it's really fun to get the community involved in the, in the home decorating. Um, Festivals. So I was in touch with an organization who's interested in partnering with the city for a Diwali festival this year. Um, they said they would run it, help, pay for a lot of stuff. And, and so I told them to contact our cultural commission and make a presentation. There's uh, people, uh, communities all around us that have the festivals, and we don't have anything here that's of a nature where the entire community can get involved. So... I'm going to send them your, your way um, to do that because they're really interested in starting something in Santa Clara and they would bring experience and resources that I think would be helpful for us. Um, Pegasus at the Trite Museum. I know for, for years we've talked about Burning Man art and, and trying to place it somewhere in our city. I could really envision, when you said 25,000, I'm thinking, wow, that's so doable. I can really envision a partnership between um, the Burning Man Art and the Triton Museum, where still many people in our community don't even know that fabulous museum exists. Uh, because if we put something like that in, in front of the Triton Museum, I think it would really generate hordes of interest uh, from the community and surrounding community. I mean, it's certainly Instagrammable and every other way. There'd be pictures up one side. And then at the same time, we could have events at the Triton Museum to really showcase what's there. It, it would be a, you know, a destination place. So I think that should be absolutely pursued. Uh, and it will also help our museum as well. Uh, Friday Night Live, I love the fact that you're looking at bringing that back. Um, I'm all in favor of as many events as we can have in our city. I think, especially after the pandemic, our community is starving to be together, and they love to be together wherever it is. I attended almost every concert except for the one where I had to go to my son's graduation. I was mad at him, and I had to leave town for the graduation because I missed the salsa dancing. Um, but I attended virtually every event, and they were so people were so grateful thanking me, thanking our staff. Our staff got involved. I saw them all dancing and having fun and being involved. And um, it really was, it's, it's, it's really a wonderful experience to go to these events and see the community involvement. So as many as you can have, I, I want to ask you, because I know there's cities around us like Sunnyvale that has weekly concerts during the summer. So I'm wondering how do they do that? Do they partner with business? Do they do that on their own? What kind of budgets do they have? And you, you, you may not have the answers now, but I'm wondering how these communities, I go to a lot of events in cities around us that, um, and I'm, I, I'm curious how, how are they executing all of these things? So I'm, I'm curious to, to find out at some point, not tonight, but at some point. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you do because especially for the budget you have. You, you all do so much, and you're so involved and so passionate about bringing culture and art to our community. And I say I very much support what you do, and I think it's pretty fabulous. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you to um, <clears throat> the Cultural Commission tonight for showing up and being here. Um, thank you to your serv for your service as well. Uh, one thing I've no noticed is that, you know, I had a privilege growing up here in an environment where I had multicultural uh, uh, communities around me. And something that 
around this country you don't see often. Uh, I know people that come here from across the country and they've never seen so much diversity in one spot. And I think that's our greatest strength. I think that was our greatest strength, you know, growing up here. And again, it's a privilege to have that kind of environment. Um, and I, I think what you guys do is kind of enhancing that. And I want to see a little more of that, um, uh, of that kind of enhancement. Um, one thing I do like what you guys do, and it's the common thing, is the home decorating contest for Halloween and Christmas. Um, I think those are key signature things that we have going on here. I know in the past uh, when there was the winners, I think it was when we first got elected onto the city council in 2020, uh, we were supposed to go out and do videos with the winners of those uh, districts. Well, because COVID was around, that prevented us from doing it. And they were also going to be on the t city television channel. So now that COVID, we're beyond COVID now, maybe we could start getting back and doing those kind of things again, as the mayor said, uh, rewarding the, those who have won. Um, one I got to say is that I, uh, I think it's on uh, Sloan Court, uh, which has been there since I was a kid. I think District 6, it's been undefeated. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever won besides Sloan Court in District 6. But they have a signature uh, home that actually goes to the music. And that's been around since I was a little kid. So it's kind of something that I like to see continuing uh, within our community and continuing that tradition. So I appreciate you guys continuing that and keeping that going. Um, <clears throat> really did enjoy the Mechanical Horse. Uh, it was a great event to be at. I know I referenced it a lot to the artist that it reminded me of the TV series Westworld. Uh, he said he's gotten that reference a lot as well. Um, glad you guys continued that event. And then looking at some of the things that you guys wanted to, you know, looking forward in future projects, I know that on, uh, I personally want to see it during our priority setting se session and discussing about city our citywide arts master plan. Um, that I think is a major priority because again, we are a community of such multicultural backgrounds, which leads me into the next thing about having more events here. I, I try to understand a little bit about, I think it's Howley. Is there, has there been any events for Howley here? I might have been out of loop on that. Holy? Holy, okay, sorry, my apologies. So educated on that today. Um, and so I want to see something like that in our community. And I know, as the mayor said, you, there's other places around our community that are having these major events that we aren't having. And so that's something I would like to see. And going back to um, uh, Prop 28, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I would like to see, you know, reference that as in our priority with the City Rights Arts, Arts Master Plan. And then also increasing your budget as commissioners. I want to see your budget increased uh, for either trainings or for uh, any of those other needs that the commission needs. So I just appreciate what you guys do and have put these events together. Uh, and again, you know, our door is always open to communicate with you and see what we can do to help you. But I hope that we can add a lot of these ideas that you guys have during our priority setting session. Thank you, Councilmember Hardy. <coughs> Thank you. I won't belabor appreciating you, but we do. So I think you're the fun commission. You get to hand out stuff and throw parties, yay. Uh, I thought if we partner with Mission College, make certain that people are understanding about the parking, because Mission College is known for being very tight about their parking and giving out tickets. I just got one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they are very, very sticky about that. So any, anything we partner with them, make certain that we have an understanding and let our residents know what parking is available. Um, I will tell you for the Halloween to the holiday lights, my neighbors who won the Halloween one, they just uh, left up those large skeletons and then put lights around it, and that was their holiday decoration. <laughs> so some people really get into this. I love the fact that when I first moved here, we thought, oh, you go up in the hills and that's where you see all the beautiful lights. And I realized, no, they're around here. And it's because of the decoration competition and people get intense. And I think that's wonderful. Um, the Arts Master Plan, I, I hope I understand, is it a lot so that you can apply for grants? Because I know that's a lot of why we did the bicycle. And that's my understanding. Um, I will clear up something for Prop 28, if you weren't real clear. That's for education. And that's a 1% for public schools. So um, you might be able to partner with them on something, but that is for public schools. Uh, 
also recognizing that uh, we have some wonderful local artists. In fact, we just lost one, Bob Tower. He passed away about a week and a half ago. Yeah. And um, he did amazing artwork of all our historic homes. And I have always thought that a recognition of him at, and all those beautiful, um, all the artwork that he did in the Triton would probably be a nice exhibition. Um, I'll also throw out another word called shower curtain. You think, what is that? Uh, not shower curtain, sorry, water, I even wrote it down, water curtain. It is a, there's, there's um, set ones and then there's ones that can be brought in, but it is water and then it's programmable. And they're pretty cool and they have lights. and. And I, I was thinking about making some kind of a statement. We've all been to Chicago and had to have our picture in front of the jelly bean. And I, I realized doing that, I remember, this is just, it's just an art exhibit, but it is something, and you know you're in Chicago when you have that picture taken there. So I thought, if we had something that was high tech, like this water curtain type situation in front of maybe next to our um, Santa Clara statue. Maybe something like that could be um, a place making. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Jane. Yes, yeah, so when I was on planning commission, <clears throat> um, I noticed that some of our surrounding cities had 1% art fees, um, impact fees, and it requires a nexus study. But at the time, the city attorney said that there was a lawsuit in Oakland. That was resolved, and now all the cities around us have a 1% impact fee for development to do you know, public art, like statues and things. So I'm very eager to get that moving, even if it was a half a percent. We have billion-dollar developments in the city. That's a lot of money. So <clears throat> um, my wife and I, whenever we travel, we were in Asheville, North Carolina about four years ago. We took a walking tour. And when we were in Sydney last August, we took a walking tour. We're always taking walking tours. So we have a lot of historic properties, a lot of history in Santa Clara. Um, we should be supporting, and these tours are free. I mean, San Francisco has free walking tours. Um, so maybe we could support some people to do walking tours put up QR codes next to historic buildings so that people could learn the history of Santa Clara. Um, plaques, um, there's a plaque on the corner of our house, but it's for the house across the street, which is the John Montgomery house, um, the guy who did the basic aerodynamics that the Wright brothers used for their planes. Um, in terms of the street dance, um, we, uh, you probably looked at it, but there's the Mission Park Library we'd have to put down a temporary dance floor, which is common, um, or we could do the parking lot at Frozo's and Togo's. Um, that's a pretty uh, big area there. Um, and then another idea that I had was, um, you know, San Francisco City Hall, they have lights. And whenever there is a, you know, a celebration, whether it's uh, Diwali or if it's uh, Indian Independence or if it's St. Patrick's or whatever, they light it up. And so it seems like a very simple thing we could do to recognize the culture around us. Um, and then uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but when I was on planning commission, I pushed for, we have these electronic billboards around the city. And 5% um, of the time is free for promoting nonprofits and events around the city. So we could be promoting our cultural events, the Triton Museum, by using that 5% billboard time and promote our events. Finally, um, a very popular thing that the city had was the barbecue contest, the Kansas City Barbecue Contest. And I know the Rotary Club put that on. I don't know why it hasn't come back after COVID, but that seems like a very popular event. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Chahal. Thank you, Mayor. So first of all, thank you. As a former Commissioner, I thank you for your service and the time you devote towards the community as well as whole city. It's a, and thank you, thanks for, thank you for that. Uh, 
I jotted down several points, like public-private partnership, that is big, as Paul mentioned, that can take care of part of our budgeting issue if we have a limited budget from the city, if we collaborate well, find a, make a foundation. The library foundation is one example. I, I was a member for that, and it can be a very good uh, option to collaborate and um, make use of the billion dollar companies who are here basically and they can contribute a tiny chain, jump chain from that and we can be sufficient on that. Uh, other thing I would like is uh, I know we had um, International Exchange Commission earlier. I was part of that commission uh, as a first commissioner and first time commissioner on that. Uh, so that can be very beneficial. Like uh, it's, uh, we are not only celebrating the culture and the ethnicities within the country, within city, but we can go abroad. Like uh, next week, uh, Japanese students will be here, twelve students, and a few of the um, chaperones. Uh, I think we should collaborate with them. And uh, I saw at some cities they put a um, like um, art piece with the cities, or oh, ISMO, this direction, 5,000 miles or 2,000 miles, and Limerick in this direction, and, and then we can have a little bit of history, why we, they are our sister cities, basically. So that can be one art project, like uh, which can be at a library or some other place, so that uh, it gives you an idea, oh, where we are, um, sister cities, who are our sister cities. Uh, Portugal is another one, Coimbra, right? Uh, so that can be another one. Uh, uh, celebrating festivals, like I know, uh, uh, as Mayor and um, uh, Vice Mayor mentioned about Holy Diwali, uh, like all across around us, they do celebrate different uh, festivals. I'm all for it, and if we can make it happen, Central Park is a very good venue for celebrating like that, and Holy is one, it's coming up. I, I think we got an invite from other cities to be present at their Holy festivals, and we are not doing it our own city. Hopefully we can do that. And uh, we can, as Mayor said, we can put you in touch with some organization which organize at uh, different cities. We can put you in touch with those. Uh, collaboration with Triton Museum, that can be very um, uh, beneficial to both the organization, basically city as well as to Triton. Um, we are celebrating different months, like African American Month is a February, November is a Sikh, history, Sikh Awareness Month. Uh, we can have exhibit. I, I remember one time Triton had a Sikh exhibit within the Triton Museum. So that can be other exercise we can do to make our residents aware of different religions, different ethnicities, and different cultures, basically. So that is another one. Uh, I support the walking tours, which um, comes from a Jane mentioned about it. And uh, second, street dance. I'm all for it. Like, street dance is pretty famous. Like, even if you have to uh, make it happen along with uh, another concert, if the bandwidth is not there to uh, make it happen, one of the concerts along with the street dance type of a thing, that would be beneficial. And uh, I'm all for it. Yeah. And thank you for your service. I appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, echo um, the sentiments of many, and thank you for all of your hard work and commitment to this uh, to commission. Um, I want to echo also uh, regarding the festivals, and uh, I know Holy is taking place right now. A, a group in my neighborhood had a Holy event this past Saturday, and uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I, there was an event last uh, last year. And uh, because Sunnyvale had to cancel because of the weather. And so somehow they ended up in Santa Clara. And it was just so many people were there. It, and it's a great turn, great turnout. There, were, there was a Bollywood dance contest. I was a judge with the mayor of, of Sunnyvale. We just had so much fun. And I don't know what kind of a budget it entails, but uh, I, I know it will be welcome because our city is so diverse and it definitely uh, is, is a great bonding opportunity. Uh, going back to the concerts in the park, um, 
you know, uh, just just keep doing what you're doing and just keep adding the food trucks as well because I know that they are a great draw to get people out there and some people uh, come out just for the food trucks. So, uh, and last year you had a great lineup, especially up in the north side. So thank you for all of that. Uh, the home decorating contest, I know that the person who won for District 1 is planning on something even bigger and better this year and getting other neighbors involved, so I can only imagine um, what that's going to be like next year. Um, let me see, there was another comment that, I, oh, yes, and then when it comes to the home decorating contest, thank you for the maps, because I see it all over social media. People are always asking, you know, where are the house winners, and, and somebody will say, oh, this is the uh, link for the map, and they just keep sharing it around, so people really appreciate that, so thank you for doing it. And uh, I know we're running out of time, but um, just thank you for everything. Oh, master plan, the citywide arts master plan. I had a talk with um, the property manager of Rivermark Plaza recently, and one of the things he talked about was having public art in Rivermark Plaza, and just um, just temporary, doesn't have to be anything permanent, but um, if that's something that you're uh, interested in doing and working with, you know, with other uh, groups uh, in, in the area, I, I can put you in touch, because I actually mentioned to him that our cultural commission was looking at doing public mm -hmm. art. And um, and that's all I have. But again, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, um, Councilmember Park. Sorry, I have a lot of things to say, but I'll try to keep it short. Alon, thank you all for the work that you do. Um, I know everyone wants to see more events, but I also hear that the events take a lot of time to plan. I mean, we trying to get something to three months from ex from planning to execution, but it, take, it takes six months to a year. And I think that um, nothing. Um, stops you from doing a, an incremental plan and then coming to us with a, with a master plan saying this is what we'd like to do and this is the budget that we think we need to do this. Um, but, but adding events incrementally, little by little. Um, as the mayor said with the potential Diwali festival, if you go to different communities, it turns out that a lot of people have things that they would like to do and they will do a majority of the work if you tell them this, this reach out to the community and get a lot of events, new, you know, new events without having to do most of that work yourself. Um, I know Friday Night Live, Friday Night Live in San Jose, I just know, sorry, not Friday Night Live, First Fridays, but you just know, you go on First Fridays, you go to Market, and you know, just the <clears throat> street next to Market, and something's there. Um, nobody has to market it, nobody has to say anything, you just go there and it's there. It would be really nice if we had these kinds of events where if you've lived in Santa Clara for three months, you know that there's an event here, like the Farmer's Market I know, on Franklin Street, you just know it's there, and this is something that you can do as well. So I would love if we had low-key events. Maybe they start really small, and you don't market them very well. You just have it word by mouth, a uh, word of mouth, and see how big they can grow. Um, decoration competitions, I like the different houses. I like being able to go different places, but I think one of the draws of the places north of Santa Clara is that entire neighborhoods are doing this. And maybe if you had the best neighborhood or best street competition as well, and give people who are visiting these places a walking experience, like a walking tour, that would be amazing. Because it's really bad if people are driving to one place, looking at something, getting out, and then driving to another place, looking at something and getting out. I will say, when we went trick-or-treating last year with my daughter and her friends, we all went to, River, to Rivermark. And at Rivermark, they actually know how to do this well. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of people there. And if you go to the other place in the city, it's almost dead. I don't know if it's because of the children. I don't know if it's because of the, the, um, uh, the initiative that the, the neighbors and the residents are taking, but there are some big displays. And this is a place where you have shared lawns. You don't necessarily have well-demarcated lawns, but the shared lawns they use really well. They put up huge displays that you couldn't do on a single house. Right? And this was something that you got out of your car if you could find parking, and you walked around, and you could walk around for, for an hour, two hours, keep going to different places. Um, digital billboards, uh, they're being used by the Triton right now. Thank you to City Manager um, Jovan Grogan for helping out with this. We're uh, using them for Triton. And I would love to see more events, like more pro nonprofits using the billboard space as well, because it is really good space, and um, people do take notice. Uh, the sister city sign, I think that Councilmember Chahal has talked about sister city sign. I know that when um, Debbie Davis was 
president of Sister Cities, the Youth Commission, the Sister Cities Youth Commission was talking about it because we saw this sign at a lot of Sister Cities, which is just a pole, and it says Izumo, you know, thousands of, of miles this way, and this one this way, and you can add more names, and there were spaces for more names on there. And this is just a kind of a cool place. I feel that if the city could provide a space for this, that the you know cultural commission and the youth commission could easily come up with either a contest or something to get the community involved to say, hey, this is what we'd like there. It doesn't have to be a sign. It could be something else, but something that ties everything together so when people go someplace, um, there's lots of things that they can see, and those things that they see help them learn about Santa Clara, and they can find out about other, other things. But thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we're at the end of our time period, but I'd like to give you um, time to make some final comments, uh, Chair um, Candida. Sure. <clears throat> well, thank you for the information. Um, I know that we have uh, been in talks with a group for Diwali, so we are in the works and having discussions and have had discussions with other neighborhood community groups about expanding uh, even with the uh, Korean community and different things about expanding some of those events, so we definitely are interested and uh, willing to do that. Um, as far as announcing the winners, that's something very easy that we can do and bringing those winners for our holiday and um, Halloween uh, decorating contest to the city council meeting. And I remember when we were supposed to have the city council members go to the houses and then COVID and then I was delivering the signs by myself and leaving them at the doorsteps. So that's what happened uh, COVID year. Um, but yeah, definitely that's something that uh, we would uh, love to do. Weekly concerts, oh, I think we would down, be down for weekly concerts. It's just funding, resources, um, and it does, again, take a lot of time because of the contracting process and, you know, doing all of those things. But if we could, I, no, I would be all I'm just wondering what's, what Sunnyvale yeah. and other cities do. Yeah, they can't do it on their own volunteer commission. So what it, yeah. how, what, who, who helps them? Yeah, so we'll yeah. definitely look more into that, but I would love to be able to, yeah, have a sandwich, uh, street dance, that would be wonderful, and more uh, concerts, definitely. But again, maybe that partnership with Mission College might help us get there in order to do some bigger and um, uh, more uh, events, and I would definitely look into the parking situation. Uh, public art, I think that there is no end to the enthusiasm for art with the Cultural Commission and our commissioners. So we definitely will be continuing with that process. And again, uh, Citywide Arts Master Plan is something that you've heard and will continue to hear. Um, and hopefully we'll get um, some movement on that in the very near future. I don't know if anyone has anything else that you took out, but I have a page of notes here. Mm -hmm. yeah, I will mention that the, uh, with the decorations, uh, we do hand out the signs so they are able to display them on the day of but we'd be very happy to go and have everybody come on in to be recognized by the city council as well as have you go out to them. Uh, with your comment about going and having a specific, uh, having a group entry, we're actually looking at expanding on both competitions to have a possible group entry for uh, citywide. And that way we can get some streets getting together rather than doing it district by district, have it just a citywide group entry for that, so. We used to have the streets that were mm -hmm that were on or just the streets, but they always came into the council meeting. It was just since COVID that they, we, you know, they didn't come in. So I'd like to bring it back to the way it was because of the excitement Absolutely. and the pride that they came in, that they were winners. They spent a lot of time. So, well, thank you very much. I think we're at the end of our time period. I know they have to turn this room over. Um, but again, appreciate you all coming. Thank you for this. It's a, it's a conversation that's going to keep on going because there's, all sorts of things that we all want to do. And we have our goal setting session to remind you on Monday at the convention center starting at noon, from noon to five. And we'll have several, um, a few, two opportunities for public comments during that time as well. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Of course, you're welcome to stay for the council meeting too.
in the council chambers, confirmation of a quorum city clerk? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I'm confirming a quorum. All right, so we have two items for closed session. Uh, I don't see our city attorney here, um, but it's conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code 54957. Uh, city representative and employee organizations, but it's my understanding the closed session will be canceled for today. Is that correct? City attorney, he told me that earlier, so it is correct. That's I'd correct. like to ask if there's any public comment, anyone here in the chambers or online that would like to comment on the closed session that will not be taking place. <laughs> you don't have anyone online? No hands, ma'am. All right, thank you very much. We're going to adjourn then until the seven o'clock uh, City Council Stadium Authority Board meeting. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Could you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for our statement of values? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. People with justice to all. Let us seek wisdom so that we may act in the best interests of our people, our neighbors, and our country. All this we ask so we may serve our community with fairness and respect, putting their needs before all. Uh, thank you. Please be seated. City Clerk. Council Member, Board Member Watanabe. Here. Council Member, Board Member Shahal. Present. Council Member, Board Member Hardy. Present. Council Member, Board Member Park. Here. Council Member, Board Member Jane. Here. Vice Mayor, Vice Chair Becker. Here. Mayor and Chair Gilmore. Here. Thank you. The AB 23 announcement. Members of the Santa Clara Stadium Authority, Sports and Open Space Authority, and Housing Authority are entitled to receive $30 for each attempt of conduct. This includes mutual respect, robust discussion, and allowing city business to be done in an efficient and all conversations must conclude, and everyone in attendance should come to order and attention. Welcome and thank you for your participation. For those joining us this evening in the capacity of a registered lobbyist, we ask you to please identify yourself as such and disclose the claim. Everyone, for today's meeting, the council is back in person and is conducting its meeting in a hybrid manner, the office. Members of the public can still join via the link and or call into the Zoom meeting phone number in the Zoom application or press star nine on your phone. Please only raise your, we'll call on you to speak. As a friendly reminder, members of the public have two minutes to speak on an agenda item and three and to ensure that members of the public are seeking to speak on the tonight. I'm going to ask that our city council uh, passed away on March 18th, 2024. Jennifer began working for the city in 1976 as city manager in 1987. She served as a city manager. City employees have praised her leadership skills and built a strong relationship with the city council. Jennifer's in council and also the support of the community under her leadership and replaced Central Park Library. Together, now please join me in a moment of silence. A few words about um, Jennifer and also, and uh, thank you for coming, Judy, as well. Carol. Thank you. So many city staff and members of the public here as well did a, a tremendous job. She was a stupendous city manager. Um, um, and the council recognized her at that time as well. Council and the ones that the staff did. And she worked very closely with her staff. She had extraordinary um, thank you. I, I have to thank you on behalf of the family who couldn't be here tonight. As I was her first manager. hire when she started as city manager in the most yeah. of pleasure. <laughs> we don't talk about that. Thank you. But I had the pleasure of uh, in why we're such a wonderful city is because of her leadership. So thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. A whole lot of time to do anything, but when, um, when she's in turn, we will have our, our flags at half mast as well in her honor. Also put out um, when and if she has services in the ends here, and people will want to pay her the respect. So uh, thank you so much on that, which is reports of action taken in closed session, city attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, for the public, uh, council did not. Continuances, exceptions, and reconsideration. This agreement with Bay FC for the use of the youth soccer park as a practice facility, consent calendar. So that will be, Right, uh, seeing none, we are now going to move on to our special order. Okay, Red Cross and the volunteers of Red Cross to each other, aren't we? March is Red Cross month. Every March we honor the action 
Gakar, is he here with us today? Oh, he's not here today. So I'm inviting you to the podium, which you're already here to speak. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, here in Santa Clara for 30 years, um, we have a business and both the, by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of its donors. Each year, March is designated Red Cross Month. We use every eight minutes, we rely on our workforce, nine free services during local home fires, wildfires, as well as national hurricanes, tragic can save three lives. All of our services are made possible thanks to the many gen generous donors. We are proud that 90 cents of every dollar we spend is invested in providing humanitarian services to those in need. Here are some highlights of this year, this fiscal year. Disaster services. In FY23, we responded to over 100 disasters in Silicon Valley. We support over 1,900 volunteers. Our volunteers have met to provide food, shelter, comfort, as well as casework, financial assistance, and other services. We have Sound the Alarm, which our volunteers respond to two to three home fires each week in Silicon Valley. The Sound the Alarm reduces the number of fire deaths by in, uh, increasing working smoke alarms in at-risk communities. We canvass door-to-door -door in at-risk communities to install free smoke alarms and educate families on fire prevention and safety. We've installed 460 smoke alarms and uh, made 200 home homes safer. Our biomed services, we collected 16,500 blood units of blood across 546 blood drives in Santa Clara County. Blood and pellets are needed for accident and burn victims, heart surgery patients, organ transplants, adults and kids receiving treatment for leukemia, cancer, and other diseases. Red Cross provides 40% of the nation's blood supply, the largest in the U.S. Preparation and training. We trained over 2,400 people in aquatic and water safety. We certified 16,800 people in first aid, CPR, and AED. Our international services, we're part of a global network of 190 Red Cross, Red Crescent societies and over 17 million volunteers. We respond to disasters, build safer communities, and educate future humanitarians. Since 2000, we have vaccinated more than 2.9 billion children in 88 countries against measles and rubella, which has helped reduce measles death by a staggering 80% worldwide. It's, it's all provided by donors at the cost of $2 per vaccine. And our service to the armed forces, <clears throat> this is where I got involved. We provided service to over 800 military members, veterans and families in Santa Clara County. <clears throat> a member of the armed forces needs to be ur urgently connected with his family members back home. A wounded service member needs support through rehabilitation and financial assistance and post-career services are needed for members and families. So thank you again for inviting us tonight. You can help by volunteering, donating, giving blood, um, or getting trained. Redcross.org. And we are so very grateful to the Red Cross for all that the Red Cross does for our community. Would you please join me up here for a photo with the city council? The past few years, we have honored the importance of arts education in Santa Clara County. This evening, we are honored to proclaim March as Youth Art Month in the city of Santa Clara. 
Youth Art Month is a time to celebrate art education and recognize the contributions of art educators. This evening, we have the arts coordinator, Sophia Fojas, from the Santa Clara County Office of Education, joining us. So if you'd please come forward to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gilmore and the Santa Clara City Council members for your support of arts education in our schools by presenting Youth Arts Month uh, proclamation tonight. My name is Sophia Fojas. I'm the arts coordinator of the Santa Clara County Office of Education. I lead Artspiration, SCCOE's arts initiative that began in 2007. In my role, I support districts implementing a comprehensive arts education. I co-manage Arts Ed Connect grant to teachers with SV Creates and conduct the Young Artist Showcase, which houses the largest collection of youth art in any county office in the state. Youth Arts Month began in 1961 by actually the National Art Education Association to recognize art as a critical part of a well-rounded child's education. Encouragement and commitment to the arts by students, community organizations, businesses, government agencies, and individuals was the goal of the initiative. Now, in 2024, research shows the ways participation in the arts develops a path to creative self-expression, instills a sense of belonging, prepares students for a 21st century workforce, and connects families and communities to rich cultural experiences. The positive effects of arts ed participation in schools are seen in increased attendance, higher academic achievement, greater confidence, and believe it or not, higher civic engagement. We need the arts and creativity and what they bring now more than ever for every child and every educator in our schools. So coming up on April 4th is our second annual Vivor Mariachi Showcase at the Mexican Heritage Plaza at the School of Arts and Culture, a celebration of Mexican music and dance with special guest Mariachi Los Gavilanes, the Monaco Middle School in Las Vegas. In fact, we are doing a little tour to Santa Clara High School and playing two performances for the students there. And on May 16th, we're celebrating arts with a theme, The Arts Are Culture, for our Young Artist Showcase a celebration we've held since 1997, and in fact, house um, works over a thousand pieces. So on behalf of the Santa Clara County Office of Education, and as a child myself who learned the violin in the fourth grade and then went on to become a public school music teacher, thank you for recognizing March as Youth Arts Month in Santa Clara. Thank you for empowering the young artists throughout our community. Prior to this meeting today, we had an, a long meeting with our cultural advisory committee, committee. So we had a long discussion about arts and arts in Santa Clara. So this is very timely. Could you please join yes. me up there with our city council? <laughs> Sophia liked our proclamations, thought they were artistically beautiful, right? Is that what, isn't that what you said? <laughs> oh, take your notes. Thank you so Thank much. You. For our final special order of business this evening, the city is recognizing endometriosis awareness month for the first time. Endometriosis is a disease in which tissue similar to the lining of the uterus grows outside the uterus. 
An estimated one in 10 women in the United States experiences, experience endometriosis. However, because of the lack of knowledge of the disease, as well as stigma, there's an average delay of 10 years from onset of, cysts, of symptoms to diagnosis. Education and awareness will help reduce the, this treatment gap. With us this evening is Diana Zamora Marquin. Is she here? Diana here? Oh, there you are. There you are. I see you now. A board member of the Democratic Activists for Women Now, also known as Dawn. So I'd like to invite Diana to the podium to say a few words. All right, very good. Thank you. You're welcome. This side around the face. Face yes. Thank, Thank you, esteemed council members and mayor. My name is Jenny Higgins, and I'm also on the board of, of Dawn. And I'm speaking in place of Diana because I actually am an endo survivor. I'm going to give you, to relate it back to a person, I'm going to throw out some numbers. 45, the amount of years I've been suffering this. 23 years the amount of years it took me to get a diagnosis. 11, the amount of miscarriages I had. Six, the number of doctors that have done surgery on me. Three of those were ablation, three of them were excision surgeries. And the reason that's important is, ablation is not the gold standard, but it's what's approved by insurance. And if you think about it, it's they go in inside, the mayor gave a, a nice explanation of what endometriosis is, but another thing that people don't understand is it's not just a pelvic disease. I have it in my diaphragm, and I had it in my hip. So it travels from places further than in your, um, in your pelvic toric area. Um, I've had a hysterectomy. I've had my ovaries out. I've had surgery on my diaphragm. And I'm not unique. This is pretty common. And I bet you there's women in here or people here that have endometriosis and may not know it. So my call to action to everybody here is to believe women when they say they're in pain. The other thing that we're really pushing for is to codify the insurance so that surgeries like excision, which is the gold standard, which actually removes the endometriosis, ablation is the other one, that just burns it off. That's just like cutting off a weed and it grows back, causes more damage and more scar tissue. So we need to get the insurance companies to be able to cover excision surgeries. I've spent personally, I'm lucky to have the means, over $82,000 out of pocket on my surgeries. So it's very important. Most people don't have the resources that I'm lucky to have. The other thing is, too, when, when young girls are missing school, are not able to do their activities because of their menstrual cycles, 99.9% .9 they have endometriosis and they need to be made aware, and school nurses need to be made aware of that. So that is my ask today, is to not make it taboo, to talk about it, it's, not, it's an invisible disease, but it needs to not be invisible, and to give support to women and other people that are experiencing endometriosis. Thank you for making March Endometriosis Awareness Month. Thank, um, thank you, Jenny. And when I saw this, I thought, boy, we really need to bring attention to this. So thank you so much for your advocacy and um, accessibility to come this evening to tell us about this, and we'll make sure we do this year as well. If you all like to come forward, um, we can take a picture with the city council.
Okay, now we're gonna move on to the council agenda. The next item is the consent calendar. All items are approved with one motion. It's the city consent calendar as well as the stadium authority consent calendar. Does anyone want to pull an item for discussion? Councilmember Park? Oh, I don't want to pull any items, but I did want to give some comments about some of the proclamations. I didn't, oh, one ahead. of the reasons I didn't like, like this to format do that is now. don't really get to talk about some of the people here. Um, I'm, I can't understand what. Yeah, what we would don't you really like get to. to yeah, yeah, I would. I would love to. So again, I really appreciate um, Ms. Bocchinoni and Ms. McCarthy for coming. Um, I also worked with Jennifer Sparacino, while not directly as a resident, for many years. And uh, it's really easy to dislike the city manager as a resident because they never do exactly what you want, and they never do things as quickly as you want, and they're never agreeing with every single thing that you, that you want. Um, and I think about uh, Patty, Patty Mahan's passing, and I think about uh, Jennifer Sparacino as well. I think most of my interactions with um, City Manager Sparacino were a little bit combative, <laughs> I would say. Um, but I came to respect, uh, respect her quite a bit. I used to say that, you know, it's this, you've kept the city in stasis, but the flip side of that is it kept the sta city stable. I think that nobody sacrificed more of her time and like she gave when we were in recession, she gave up her salary. I think this is something that, that's true leadership. And I really want people to understand that when people say she loved the city, she gave more for this city than I, I ever imagined. Uh, and I wanted to say very thank you for that. I also wanted to say something about the endometriosis, which is um, as an Asian man and with a wife, and I, I wanna say that Endometriosis affects Asian women, East Asian and Asian women, uh, dispor disproportionately uh, so. And I, I wanna really get a word out there for people who having issues, just ask the question, right? And I know that in the minority communities, it's harder to ask the question because people don't wanna talk about this. And it's harder to find people that speak the same language that where people feel comfortable talking about things that are more personal. And I think that this is something that we really need to work on as well. And I wanna thank you very much, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone that would like to pull a consent calendar item? Seeing none, is there a, uh, anyone in the audience or staff pulling any items of the consent calendar? No one online? All right, seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Also move. Second. Motion by Councilmember Hardy, second by Councilmember Chahal to approve the consent calendar. Please register your vote. And that action to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute a license agreement with Bay FC for the use of the U Soccer Park YSP as a practice facility for the 2024 National Women's Soccer. In the title, the item before you includes the consideration of a license agreement with the Bay Football Club, also re referred to as Bay FC. The club is the newest expansion team in the, of the National. As noted in, as noted in our staff report, the club has secured a five-year lease to play their matches at PayPal Park in San Jose. And recently, the club approached the city of Santa Clara to discuss the, the potential of holding their practices at our youth soccer park complex. Over the past month, staff has met with representatives of Bay FC, as well as representatives of our youth soccer teams that play at our YSP. The item before you includes a recommendation that the city manager be authorized to approve a license agreement and community benefit package with Bay FC for their part-time use of the youth soccer park. Tonight's formal presentation will be provided by a I'm here with great excitement to present a proposal to partner with Bay FC, the Bay, F the Bay Area's new newest professional women's soccer team. I am particularly excited about the project because it is the brainchild of four amazing women who also happen to be proud graduates of my alma mater, Santa Clara University, a university that has outstanding tradition of excellence in academics and sports and is a great source of pride for the Santa Clara community as well as the entire Bay Area. 
We are here tonight to ask the City Council to authorize the City Manager to negotiate and execute a license agreement <laughs> with Bay FC for the use of the youth soccer park, the YSP, as a practice facility for their inaugural season. As you will hear, we believe a partnership with Bay FC is a win for the team, a win for the city, and most importantly, a win for the youth, particularly young girls in our community who dream of playing soccer, just like Brandy, Allie, Danielle, and Leslie. As the council is aware, this city has invested heavily in high quality soccer fields that are in high demand. Our combination of grass and turf fields allow for play at all levels and throughout all seasons of the year. Historically, the youth soccer park has been limited to youth play, which occurs only in the late afternoon, evenings, weekends, and school vacations. During the daytime, this tremendous asset has gone underutilized. Piloting an adult program during the day will enable the city to evaluate how to maximize utilization of this asset, as well as serve as an important source of new revenue that can be used to continue the affordability of city fields for youth sports. Bay FC is a professional women's soccer expansion team with strong local ties to Santa Clara, Oops, Santa Clara, sorry, that is looking for a practice facility until their permanent facility is built. The founders of the team are four local women, Olympians from Santa Clara University, who have a vision of promoting a global brand that will bring excitement for professional women's sports. They recognize that excitement is built on a fan base that starts young and starts young local. It is the intersection of these two interests, the city's interest to maximize a valuable asset for the benefit of the community, and the team's interest to grow a sport built on community, on engaged fan base, and a sense of giving back that has brought both parties to agree that a partnership between the two will benefit the city of Santa Clara community now and in the future. The request from Bay FC is as follows. The use of one grass field and building support amenities, the community room, training room, and restroom shower facilities at YSP, for practice sessions during the hours of 10 and 2 p.m. twice a week from the end of March through the end of the season in November. We are anticipating a, city, a season extended by that team making it to the playoffs. In the event of bad weather, the team is also asking that they be allowed to schedule eight additional days on the turf field so that, they can, so that the team can continue to practice without any damage being done to the grass fields. This use would be subject to availability and notice. The final element of their request is that the fields be properly lined and sufficiently maintained to ensure the safety of Bay FC players. This cost has been factored into the projected fee schedule. Oops. I'm sorry. Can you back me up? I'm looking for the community benefit slides. I'm sorry. Page slide four. There you go. In return for the use of the YSP, the team is proposing the following community benefits. The first is to conduct an open practice so that the local community can watch Bay FC's practices and interact with the player and coaches. The second benefit formalizes that interaction through the sponsors of five one-hour individual player appearances during the season with the local soccer community. The third benefit builds on the first two and includes three two-hour clinics led by Bay FC coaching staff. These first three benefits will create the connection between Bay FC and the Santa Clara community, whereby the YSP will gain the reputation as the place for outstanding youth soccer development. But that is not all the team is proposing. In addition to the engagement aspect of the proposal, Bay FC is proposing to make the city an official community partner, opening doors to corporate partners and key stakeholders. This is an area the council has indicated they would like the city to explore more. The next benefit is discounted group tickets for youth soccer players. Tickets would be made available for two to four home games. PayPal Stadium, where Bay FC will play their home games, will rock with the cheers of Santa Clara youth soccer players. The final benefit is a donation of equipment, materials, and other supplies with a value of up to $25,000 to improve the experience of youth soccer players at YSP. The city lacks a funding and support for capital needs is well known, which makes this benefit particularly attractive. In addition to this continued prioritization of the use for youth sports programs, the parties agree and acknowledge that the city's investment in the YSP for the benefit of youth programs will be amazing. We know that the community will be watching and both parties are committed to maintaining the tradition of excellence at the facility, 640, and a high of 224,736 with an option to add eight dates at the same rate. Bay FC has expressed a willingness to augment and council authorize the city manager to negotiate and offset for fees if appropriate. Our next step is to receive your feedback and ask staff to explore partnerships as a way of improving service to the Santa Clara community. We believe that this proposal does just that. 
As this video will show, now is the time. Time for the first season, time to showcase what Santa Clara has to offer, time to partner with legends. I would like to introduce to you the Bay FC legends that are here tonight with us tonight and ask them to stand as I call their names. First is Bay FC CEC, General Manager Lucy Rustin, Head Coach Albertine Montoya, Technical Director Matt Potter, Director of Football Operations. <laughs> So as I mentioned, the next steps is really it's time to partner. And so now I want to show you um, some of the excitement that we're hoping to partner in. Yeah, you've been waiting and now it's here. It's time for the first match of the first season. And uniting the Bay. The start of a new rivalry as we bring some Bay Area attitude to Hollywood. It's <laughs> this concludes the report. The recommendation for council consideration is to 2024 and November 2020, November 27, 2024, with the terms and conditions outlined in this report for mutually agreed upon community benefit with an option to allow Bay FC to use the Y. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions about the recommendation and the Bay FC team is prepared to speak. Yeah, shortage of fields, and it's good to use them as much as we can. Um, my concern parks to have yoga classes outdoors, and that was prohibited. So how is this different than what they were trying to do? Um, and then how is do the regular youth programs um, by this? By this, they're going to rotate grass fields so that they don't damage the field, and there's time for it to replenish. But um, uh, when there aren't our current, you know, um, I think that's question about Measure R. Um, I also so I like the idea that we the idea was to rotate, and um, I wanted to be real clear. Um, so, could it continue on, or we could just approve it again if it goes well? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Um, we're coming up on uh, the sporting and the uh, youth soccer league season, and so uh, I'm just wondering if the fields will be monitored more often. Uh, I know they, they use them for, for games or matches as opposed to they use the turf fields for practice. Um, for updates, check-ins, what's the plan for uh, just communicating? And I believe that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Chahal. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation, and thank you being <clears throat> so many good players being present here. <clears throat> uh, my question is, uh, mm, I know you did mention that the first priority will be to the youth mm, already engaged in the, those soccer parks. Uh, during these time slots, um, what we are um, talking about for the Bay FC, are there any practice session for the existing youth in the past, or we don't? use the field at all yeah that's my question thank you any other questions uh councilmember park yes um thank you very much for the report thank you very much for remembering my request to seek out these kinds of partnerships i do have a question about that as well which is what if during the the period there is a conflict i mean what how do we res resolve the conflict um, do we say that, well, we've agreed on this schedule and therefore a youth soccer just uh, doesn't get access? Um, that question becomes a little bit more difficult when you want to extend, if you want to extend uh, time and it wasn't necessarily scheduled in advance. Um, but again, I would really love to see AFC have access to these fields. I mean, I think that it's one of the things that like people, we have our soccer games and people know about them, but I think that Bay FC coming here will, will make that much bigger, will give us much more visibility um, to not just the, the soccer fields, not just to soccer itself, but also to the city of Santa Clara. And I, I really thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, thank you. The question I have is that uh, Bay FC will want the fields to be in pristine condition for safety reasons and because it would be at the level that they need to play at um, when they play their games. So after a weekend of the youth tearing up the fields, 
and then we hand it over to Bay FC on Monday after a, you know, a very rigorous weekend. What happens to the fields and who's responsible for maintaining them? Because it may be at, they're going to be used to a different level that maybe our youth are used to in terms of the field maintenance. So I'm, I want to know how that's going to be handled and how is it going to be handled in the contract to assure that the youth always have priority over, um, over, over anything or any, any organizations. And I have a lot of comments, but I'll save them to the end. And I think that's it, so when you're ready to answer questions. The way we do it here is we do all the questions ahead of time and then our staff has to write them all down and then attempt to answer them, so go ahead. So I'm gonna defer the question about Measure R to the attorney, so when it gets to that point, I'll try to answer it, but um, we have con uh, communicated, but I'll get to that at the end. Um, in terms of conflict, the way that we're gonna able to handle the, the prioritization is right now we do not um, schedule anyone at the YSP until the youth time starts. And so when we've talked to BAFC, we talked about we would not let, they'd have to be out by three o'clock. No question. So um, that, that would not have any conflicts. And there are no other adult users at the time, at the current time, so there would again be no conflict. Um, we are proposing to do this as a pilot. So to Council Member Jane's question, um, we'd like to only have the one user for that time period to see what what the relationship is and how we can work it out. And if there's any conflict, making sure that the youth is a priority. That's, that's our number one um, goal is to make sure that, and it's Bay FC's number one goal as well, is to make sure that what the, the investment in the facility maintains um, the priority for youth. And so I'm sure that they'll come up and, and reiterate that. Um, so there is no impact to the regular, there should not be any impact um, to the regular programs and we'll define that by the hours um, and the days of operation. In terms of your question, Mayor, about the maintenance, they are proposing to use it on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so that will give us a day to do some maintenance um, and, and to take care of that. Um, in terms of the rotation, yes, the rotation is to use one grass field and then the other grass field and then rotate back, back and forth, so to alleviate the impact of the fields. Um, continue to extend, um, we would love to have them back and to have them as long as they want to be here. Um, but again, we want to pilot it first and then make sure that everything goes well um, and then come back with a recommendation to pilot. And they've also ex expressed an interest to want to partner with, um, as long as it's working for both parties. Um, uh, Mayor, to your question is who is responsible for maintenance? There, there is some fees in there. And then again, we've also talked about um, the opportunities to um, talk about a donation for to help us with equipment. For, for example, we've talked about a liner. Um, there's a robot um, that can actually line the fields that can help with the maintenance be much faster. We've talked about maybe partnering on that on that kind of thing, um, but we will address that as, as, as part of a license agreement. Um, I think that's all the questions. Oh, the communication. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, we will. They will be meeting with staff on a regular basis. Again, it's really important for both teams, both parties, to have good quality fields. So um, we know that our priority is to the youth, and we've been pretty clear with the team about that and making sure that the fields are maintained. And so um, they've also been very helpful with us in terms of wanting to maintain communication. I think their presence here tonight and to have such a big presence tonight is telling of their commitment to wanting to have a good relationship with the city. Um, as I mentioned, they're really interested in, in um, promoting their brand, and they know they recognize that a fan base, you have to have good good relationships. So um, they've talked a lot about wanting to partner with the cities above and beyond what they've already talked about. And so I'll let them speak to what that might look like um, and their level of comfort. Um, but again, I think you're, you're right, regular communication will be important to the ongoing pilot. I think that's all the questions. Like, except for the Measure R, I'm sorry. So Measure R um, requires 100, um, is subject to 180 days. This is a license agreement. Um, and so the number of days that we're talking about is 80 days um, and no more than 88 days. So um, Measure R will not apply in that instance, um, but if the city attorney wants to add on to that. Yeah, thank you, that, that's correct. We did look at Measure R um, to determine whether or not there was any legal prohibition on this use and determined that there, there was not. It is a use similar to the existing uses and the license isn't a permanent disposition or exclusive lease, which is really what 
um, measure our contemplates and would require a vote for. We also looked at the potential for other legal limitations. We understand the pattern in practice has been to use this field for youth purposes, but there's no permit condition or recorded covenant or anything else. It's really up to the council to decide how to use you know, the property, um, and certainly a youth orientation and priority can be maintained, but it's within your discretion uh, as to how to um, manage that and, and, and dispose of that, and this kind of use is lawful. All right, um, why don't we hear from the team now? Someone would like to speak? If you wanna speak. I would imagine that. Good Welcome. evening, uh, I'm Brandy Chastain, oh, excuse me. I lost my voice on Sunday's game, so if, if it corrects, that's because I did too much cheering uh, over the victory. Um, it's a pleasure to be here representing Ali Wagner, Danielle Slayton, Leslie Osborne, Bay FC, every young girl and woman who loves soccer, and every woman who um, aspires to be something um, greater than what other people have told her that she could be. So this being Women's Empowerment Month, I think, and Women's History, I think this is really appropriate that we're here tonight together. Um, the first line I wrote uh, on my notes was, I am Santa Clara. Uh, I have lived, I have gone to school, my husband works at Santa Clara University for the last 37 years. Um, I started a nonprofit. Our first elementary school was down the street at Pomeroy Elementary. Um, we have worked with over 20,000 girls on playgrounds throughout the community. Um, I feel that giving back is something that my grandfather, who, as I was going down into my basement to grab a bag for some travel, I found this poster of my grandfather with myself and my brother on his lap and he was um, hoping to get votes for the Santa Clara School Board. Um, so we have been a part of giving back to the community since I was about three. I, I, sorry it's not in great shape. <laughs> um, so I think that's really important and what we as found the four founders believed um, in when we started talking about this over three and a half years ago was that we would create an environment and a team, a club, a brand that would be player centric, that would support uh, young girls and women in their as aspirations on the field and off the field, uh, that we would be an example to um, the world about the impact that women could have in sports specifically, but also in, in the business of sports. And that has, has obviously grown into this beautiful club called Bay FC. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Albertine Montoya as a Santa Clara University graduate, a, a former soccer player, and now our head coach. So we have Santa Clara in our blood. Um, and. I, I'm so proud to stand before you because I remember when I was a young girl starting to play soccer for the first time in the mid-70s. My parents knew that they had an active young girl and they put me into soccer camp that was hosted by Santa Clara University and the San Jose Earthquakes. I did not have anybody that looked like me um, for me to aspire to be like. Um, but what happened one night was we went to an Earthquakes game during our, our camp and we got to play at halftime. I scored a goal and the crowd cheered and I thought this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. And I think to me, being at the Santa Clara Youth Soccer Park will give us a chance to be those heroines and those examples to the girls and the women in this community who need people to look to for modeling and can, that they can make good relationships with. This is not about us being up here and the youth players being down here. This is about a relationship that we will have with the city, that we will have with the soccer park and the players and the parents and everybody who comes. We will be respectful. We will honor the fact that this is a youth soccer park 
that we will do everything to maintain and uphold uh, that as being the primary responsibility of the park and that we are just going to be good um, tenants and, and good stewards of the fields. Um, I will also say a little lesson that my grandfather taught me through soccer, as we know sports and team sports specifically are exceptionally good at teaching life lessons. And the life lesson that he taught me that has stuck with me today is that giving is always better than, than taking. I used to love to take. I wanted the ball, I wanted to score, I wanted it to be about me. And he saw that I was not a great teammate. So he had a great idea, and that was to give me one dollar for every goal I scored, and I thought, yes, I'm gonna be a millionaire. But he'd give me two dollars for an assist. And so I started learning that giving and supporting and being there for others was really more beneficial in the long run. And so that's why nonprofit work, that's why being at the Santa Clara Soccer Park, we will help young players to aspire to be the players and the people that they hope to be. Our brand will stand out above all the rest. That is our goal. And we will work tirelessly to be the global brand uh, and the ambassador and the steward of the game that, that we see um, that can make the greatest impact. And so we would like to be able to, like we made history on Sunday, make history at Santa Clara Soccer Park and for you to be a part of that as well. <coughs> and we thank you very much for your time. And we hope that we will be going forward very soon. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, Brandy. Anyone else want to speak from the team? Welcome. Hello, Madam Mayor and members of the council. I'm Brady Stewart. I'm the CEO of BFC. I'm going to go quickly because it's almost impossible to follow up the incredible Brandy Chastain, so <laughs> I will not go that long. But the main couple things I wanted to say to this group were, number one, to thank you for considering this. We appreciate it. From our perspective, we are trying to build a global sports franchise, but we are at the very beginning of that journey. And the first thing that we need to do is engage our partners and our community locally, and this is an opportunity for us to do that. Just as big as our ambitions are around being a global sports franchise, we also have ambitions around being about what's called more than soccer. And so that is how we give back to the communities that we're a part of, how we leave the sport and the communities that we encounter and that we are a part of better than they are today. And our goals with that specifically on the community front are to provide access to the sport. So I think you saw that in our proposal where we want to have youth and members of the community come and engage with our team, watch our practices, meet the players, feel a part of BFC. We want to provide access, and we also want to provide leadership education. And so that's some of the programming that we would hope to be putting in place with the city of Santa Clara. And we're just really excited to be here, and thank you for considering us. And, and I do also want to reiterate what Brandy said. We will be great partners in this. We're very committed to that. And you know, just thank you for your consideration. Thank you. I don't let anybody come back, but I'll let you come back. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, the, another reason why I think having us at the youth soccer park would be beneficial to the city of Santa Clara is that in 2027 there will be a vote by FIFA uh, to for the next Women's World Cup, and I believe that we are. Absolutely, at the four, we are absolutely the leaders. Um, the U.S. will most likely be um, given that World Cup, and I think Santa Clara will be a place where FIFA will want to come and have um, countries from all over the world using the, this space. And I want us to be the epicenter for the future of international women's soccer, as well as being the premier place for pros to come and play. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the team? If not, I'm going to go to the public. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak on this before we make our comments? Do we have anybody online? We do not, Mayor. Any hands up? Was there here? No? Okay. I saw a hand going up over there. No. Okay. Um, 
I guess I'm gonna start by making some comments. Um, first of all, the soccer park is super important to me, and I just wanna give a little historical perspective. Way back in the 80s and 90s, it took us a long time to get this park built, and it was at a time there was really nothing else out there. Uh, the 49ers had a training facility, and there was there was nothing. They were gonna the city was gonna put a, a movie theater there, like one of the dollar movie theaters. We kind of blocked that, and I'm glad we never did that. <laughs> that would have been disastrous. But um, but at the same time, it was really really hard to get this soccer park built. It took us about 10 years. We had a committee that met mon monthly to talk about how we were gonna do it. We had fundraisers. To, ha to get this done, and I'll never forget, we had a, I think she had a gold medal at the time from the Olympics. You had some kind of medal, Brandy, but you came to our fundraiser and you washed the dishes at our fundraiser. You were so humble, you were that much into soccer and trying to help us get this soccer park built. So I know that you do have a history with this soccer park. I don't know if you even remember that, but, uh, both you and Jerry were very supportive of trying to get it done, you know, way back when. So I'm gonna fast forward to today because nobody wants to hear my all my stories, but I'm gonna fast forward to today. We have a very active soccer community in Santa Clara. We have a very active soccer community that was very, very protective of the soccer park. And back when we had Super Bowl 50, you read about it in the paper, it was nationwide how the kids were trying to, the parents to protect the soccer park from the professional sports group that was coming in trying to take it over. Um, and we ended up keeping the park, passing Measure R, so that it would be protected from here on out. Um, so fast forward to today, and we have this before us, and I, I wanna thank Council Member Watanabe for working so hard to get you before us tonight. She, uh, she took the leadership reins on this, and, um, and I wanna say that uh, she's done a fantastic job by meeting with all of you and, and helping to bring this forward. I wanna say, because Brandy came up and said that she is Santa Clara, um, and, and I agree, she is, and I would tell you that I would not go forward or even support going forward with anyone else but this group uh, because I trust that you have our youth um, in mind, that you're going to prioritize our youth. And I love, you know, I, we're gonna become world known and, and on all this, that's all well and good, but I'm here to protect and make sure I represent, you know, the youth of our community. Because to me, I love soccer. You know that I'm a soccer mom and love. I'll support your your team and everything. But for me, I have to protect our youth first. And so whatever we do, whatever is negotiated, I want to have the full understanding that our youth come first, no matter what. Um, and I like the fact that this is a pilot program because we've had professional sports teams that will go unnamed that made a lot of promises to our community that never transpired. But here now, the, the, what you're offering to our community, especially the young girl players in Santa Clara that need that support, they really need you know, women to look up to and, and to um, identify with. Uh, but you're offering us something and we'll be able to tell at the end of the season, did it happen or not? Um, I just wanna say when you have the player representatives come, I love Alex, Alex Laura, I wanna make sure she comes as well, because when Santa Clara University won the national championship, we got to know, you know some of them very well and I think a lot are on your team now. But I wanted to make it meaningful with our soccer community. Our city staff mentioned it to the community, I, soccer community, last Thursday for the first time. They, I've talked to them, they're kind of unaware of what's happening right now. So I wanna make sure when the contract is negotiated and you're meeting with our city staff that you do include our soccer community to let them know because they're the ones you're gonna be interfacing with you know, all the time. And I know all of you know who they are. And um, I wanna make sure that they're involved in this because they're not here tonight because they were not really sure what was going on and there weren't a lot of details in the, in the report. So going forward in order to make that meaningful 
um, connection with our soccer community. I want to make sure they're involved in the ultimate, ultimate agreement. Um, it goes both ways. I mean, you will help us, but we will end up helping you as well because those are your future fans. Those are the people that are going to fill up the seats, you know, to watch your games. And I love the fact that um, if you're that close to us, that, that our girls and boys will feel a connection to you, you know, unlike, you know, other organizations. And I know the earthquakes do a really good job of trying to, you know, include Santa Clara residents as well. You know, they have Taylor Almirante, who's the voice of the, you know, the earthquakes, and he brings in, you know, the, 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 the overall soccer community as well. But I love the fact that it's gonna be girls. I love it. And, and stars that care about our community. I know, you know, a lot of you, uh, the four of you, the owners, I know fairly well. So I, I'm gonna trust that you are gonna do what you say and really put our community um, at the forefront of what you're doing. And I think the partnership can be pretty tremendous. So I'm full, uh, fully um, um, able and willing to support this now, as long as our soccer community is involved in, in the discussions. So I don't make motions, so someone's gonna make a motion. All right, Council Member Chahal. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so, I studied in a boarding school, so every term we used to have a different games, and games were compulsory. Like, we could not miss it. Either you are in a hospital or you are at a games field. So I know how important it is for um, youths to develop their personality, develop, like Brandy said, double credit for assist. That's what we learned during sports, basically, how we get along with other people. Win, important but sometimes it's important to lose also. You learn why we lost and what's the impact of losing a game in a sportsman spirit, basically. It's not always going to be win, 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 right? So I am uh, all for engaging youth and adults in uh, sports arena, basically. And uh, it's, as a great ambassador uh, of soccer, Brandy, uh, it means a lot for us to be getting uh, connected, a city connecting to your team, basically. And uh, it is a mutually beneficial thing, basically, where we need to make sure that both the parties get what they are want into it. And uh, of course, we are getting the financial part of it, but more than that, like uh, your mentorship to our youth who are playing day in, day out, and uh, some of the community benefits you put forward, they're important because the youth look forward to somebody for long-term gain, long-term goals they want to achieve in particular field, basically, any field, whether it's scientist or we are trying in sports. So that's very, very important. Like you look, look forward to those things down the line. And uh, one thing I wanna make it very clear to our team over here, city attorney, city manager, uh, we have dealt with some contracts which were very ambiguous in the past and that creates a very bad impression, animosity between the two parties. I want those contracts to be very clean and I'm, I'm glad this is a pilot and we've learned some things, both the parties will learn something from this thing and how we can improve those, but I want the ambiguity to be reduced to almost zero, if at all possible, because, and it's a mutual, and we, I want to be, they also have to be a, a good partner, and we have to be a good partner on that. So that's uh, my take, and uh, with that, I will be ready to make a motion when it's time to make a motion. There, thank you. Councilmember Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Brandy, for being here and giving your input. I really appreciate it. And it's all so nice to see all of you as well. Um, I've, um, I, w I was approached by members of the team uh, earlier this year. And because 
the youth soccer park is in my district. And so I was the person to reach out to. And um, I, I appreciated that. Uh, I knew that there were you know, concerns because of the fact of the name. It's a youth soccer park. And uh, so how are we going to achieve this? You know, it's, it came, uh, I, there were a lot of great ideas. Uh, I mean, women's sports is becoming so predominant these days that this is like, wow, what an opportunity, you know, to, you know, we have the WNBA, but now we could have, you know, professional soccer, women's professional soccer, right, you know, in our backyard and, and help, you know, with your expansion team. I mean, God knows there are enough men, you know, that are, you know, made examples of, you know, in sports every day, but now here's an opportunity for women to have their moment, to be able to expand on what they've been able to do and what they can do, and also just be an example uh, to our, our youth, especially our, our young girls. And so this was really a, a, just a wonderful opportunity uh, that um, I, I feel like just fell in our laps. And so um, I so appreciate the fact that our, I mean, I know how overworked our staff is right now. We've got a lot of things going on. You've, we've got the FIFA men's, you know, World Cup coming here too in 26. And uh, we've got the Super Bowl. So, so there's a lot of things going on. So I really appreciate the fact that everybody just took took a pause to be able to focus on this because there was a time element involved as well. So. Uh, but um, I, I think uh, this is a great opportunity, again, for uh, the community, just everybody to engage and, and to bond. Uh, I think that's something that really comes about here. And also in terms of building self-esteem in young women, uh, just an in, incredible opportunity. And, uh, and to build resilience in, in our youth, but especially uh, in, in our young women. And, you know, for to have Brandy Chastain, you know, the voice, the, that that picture, you know, that was seen around the world, you know, the famous sports bra picture, you know, around the world in 1999. I mean, to have that person right here in our backyard um, helping to, you know, exemplify and, and encourage our, our youth, I think, is, is a wonderful opportunity. Um, as well, but um, the other thing I just want to add is just I appreciate that this is an opportunity uh, for um, d to help our our youth uh, sports, and uh, because affordability of youth sports has become it's a little exponential and a little cost prohibitive sometimes, and I think this is also a wonderful opportunity to help backfill some of those needs. So, so thank you for bringing this forward. Um, uh, I will support the motion when it's uh, brought forward. And again, I, I think this is a great win-win opportunity for so many. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Becker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is actually an excellent idea. I mean, I think this is one of the best ideas I've heard since I think Councilmember Jane was proposing doing some parking over there that would have made our city some money as well. So um, I would, uh, I think it's authentically Santa Clara. I think we have historical significance here. Um, you know, we keep getting told that we're the center of what's possible, but I think we're also the center of what's happening. So I will make a motion to take staff's recommendation. Second. Councilmember Hardy. Thank you. I'll just say I teach at the high school, and um, we work really hard at expanding young, young girls' vision of what's possible. When I started computer science, I had one of them say, well, can girls actually do that? And I looked at him and I said, what am I, top liver? Of course. And uh, making that difference and giving them more possibilities. And especially when they see, well, somebody else did that, I can do that too. And I love that idea. So, and it was my resolution to bring Fifi here. We bring them back with the women, I'd love it. I am the only grandparent here, and my grandkids are all obsessed with soccer, and I go up to their games as much as I can. So I, I know what my grandson's going to ask for, more tickets, Grammy, for, for soccer games. So I'm excited to uh, second this, and I'm excited to see this happen. I'd love to see it work so well that we just want to keep renewing. Thank you. Councilmember Park. Yeah, so I want to get this straight, uh, City Manager. Uh, we are paying Bay FC no more than $224,000 to help market Santa Clara, be mentors to our youth, 
donate equipment and bring professionalism to our city. Is that my understanding? They would be paying us. Oh, they're paying us. Oh, my goodness. That was a joke, city yes. manager. I think it was yeah. a joke. You'll have to decide for yourselves. But, I, I mean, I do believe that this would be uh, great for us. I'm not going to go into anything else. We have the Parade of Champions. We have the Parade of Champions for lots of reasons, and you are also one of those. If you're not already going, I would uh, invite you to come. Um, but I'd like to get on with the vote. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second on the floor for staff recommendation. I would just, again, reiterate, involve the local soccer community because that's important for the long term. And um, city manager, I would say you have the direction, you will have the direction. If it varies in any big direction one way or another, you'll bring it back to us. But other than that, um, there's a motion for the direction and a second. Please register your vote. And that passes unanimously, thank you. Thank you very much for coming tonight, thank you. All right, next we have on the agenda, we're gonna go back to public presentations. Do we have any public presentations? Uh, city manager, do we have any cards? Anyone here in person? Anyone online? Any public presentations? One, okay. We have Howard Gibbons. Oh, Howard, come forward please, Howard. Wait one second, I'm gonna ask that you take the discussions out, please, thank you. Wait a second, Howard. Oh. All right, go ahead, Howard. Okay. Thanks. Um, I noticed you guys had the meeting earlier with the uh, parks and the uh, culture commission, and uh, I was really going to give them a heads up for all the work they've been doing, uh, events I've been out doing with them, I've been growing. I remember when I was the first guy out there at the, your park, Oak, I was the one and only guy out there. And Central Park, I was one and only guy. And now I see more and more people are growing. And it's a great thing that they've been able to start growing that. And uh, I'm looking to start doing the cinema in the park. And I really like to be able to see that grow. I've done a couple of them last year, and this year I'm going to do them all. So we're trying to build that up, get more people out there. Uh, really cool when you see all the little kids out there watching those movies and having a good time, and it's something that the city's bringing to the neighborhood. Those aren't like way out in the big stuff like downtown and all that. This is taking it into the community, which is great. And uh, I'm just looking forward and want to thank those people. They, they work hard doing that. It's not easy. And uh, I'd like to see more of you guys out at some of these events. I see the mayor at every single one of them, except one this year. And then uh, Kathy shows up quite a bit. Uh, I can see Parks out there. The hall, he once in a while shows up, but I don't see nobody else. It's nice to see you out there. You get to meet with the people, and the people uh, get to see you and target you for uh, things they want to get done. And uh, these guys here, over here, I meet up on the city manager and the city attorney a lot, but this year I haven't had to come in and beat them up too much. They've done uh, some really good work on a project later, so I'm not gonna go there. And uh, just come on out, see the events that we're doing. And uh, because the competitions get a little bit stiffer out there, 
I'm going to bring the burger man out of retirement and we're going to start doing the uh, grass-fed Angus beef burgers out at the concerts. Yum. <laughs> Wait till you get a load of my burgers. <laughs> and thank you. I'll be back. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Howard. Nice, nice to see you again. All right, do we have any other? All right, thank you. We're gonna move on. We had no consent items pulled for discussion. Public hearing general business. We have item number eight, action to approve an introduction of an ordinance readopting the expired sidewalk vendor stadium pilot program, which is what he was just talking about, with a new sunset date and slightly expanded footprint. In city man, I mean city attorney, is this a public hearing official? No, um, no, item just number eight. Business item. Okay, very good. Did so, you, and you went to eight on purpose as opposed to six and seven? Did I miss six and seven? Yeah. <laughs> we're ready with it. Yeah, every, any way you want to go. We just wanted to make sure you were. Let's just go eight. Okay. Since I'd started it. Thank you. Yep. I'm trying to move the meeting along. <laughs> okay. Skipping item as a I'm Skipping items, yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'm going to go backwards. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mayor, members of council, the, the next item is an update on the sidewalk vendor pilot program and the corresponding temporary ordinance, which expired in January. The police department will summarize the program, including a review of the education and enforcement efforts that occurred. Captain Rich Fitting will describe the lessons learned, uh, along with the department's recommendation to readopt the ordinance and extend the pilot program. Captain Rich Fitting. Thank you, City Manager. Greetings, Madam Mayor, City Council, City Staff, and those from our community. It's good to be here before you again. My name is Richard Fitting. I'm a police captain with our police department, and I oversee special operations. We're responsible for public safety planning and operations for special events in the city and those that occur at Levi's Stadium. I'm going to dive right into this item. As a reminder, shown here are key points in our timeline related to this sidewalk vending topic. Uh, I won't read each of these, but it's worth noting that this conversation began when state legislation limited local enforcement authority of illegal sidewalk vending. Enforcement must be directly relative to objective health, safety, or welfare concerns. I came before you last April with an initial summary and recommendation and through subsequent action, you approved a temporary pilot program and corresponding ordinance that would authorize enforcement in accordance with the state legislation limits. We conducted significant educational efforts at three major events prior to our ordinance effective date. The ordinance in our subsequent operational plan occurred through 10 major events from September to January. Listed here are elements of the original pilot program. For this too, it is meant as a recap, so I won't read each, but we'll note that the amendments to city code and the selected footprint allowed us to narrow our focus to the primary areas of concern, both for communication, education, and enforcement with vendors. Also, I will touch on this in a moment, but our partnerships with external enforcement agencies proved valuable and key to several of our successes. Listed here were our original areas in which vending was prohibited. The recommendation this evening does include Old Glory west of Great America Parkway, which will be added to our future educational flyers if approved. Here's an example of one of our educational flyers we disseminated. As you can see, a QR code was incorporated which linked a significant amount of information on the topic, including the reports to council themselves and answers to numerous frequently asked questions. So over the course of our educational timeline and the effective timing of the ordinance, we dispersed more than 600 educational flyers in multiple languages, and with those, approximately 600 admonishments. Despite the educational efforts and opportunity for persons to conduct vending activity lawfully by obtaining permits, only two were issued and only, with only a few additional inquiries. We had employed a model of progressive enforcement, beginning with education and then seeking voluntary compliance prior to enforcement. Actually conducting enforcement, of course, requires dedicated resources 
and also ensuring those resources don't have higher priorities and responsibilities during a major event. Initially, we saw overwhelming compliance and a diminished number of vendors. However, as the season progressed, numbers did steadily increase, at which time enforcement became necessary. What we found was that when citations were issued, others would observe the interaction and disperse. I will describe the images above in a moment, but first, in review of lessons learned, we would like to add one roadway to the footprint, Old Glory West of Great America Parkway. This is an area in which we expect the approved prohibition to benefit our safety deployment. As we reflect back on the pilot program, we realize that more time is needed to evaluate strategies towards long-term compliance. We also have not deployed an enforcement model to non-NFL events, which in certain instances bring an entirely different dynamic. Pictured at the top of the slide is a roadway with significant vending activity for a non-NFL event prior to the pilot program. The picture below is the same roadway, without the vendors, for a December NFL event during the pilot program. Additionally, we would like more time to review regional responses to this issue, such as at other major venues in the South Bay or the Bay Area as in whole. Perhaps the largest lesson learned was that our partnerships are key. When the County Department of Environment, Environmental Health was present, vendor compliance was high and presence of vendors was low. However, the county has its own resource needs and staffing each event was not feasible. Furthermore, the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control was a reliable partner effectively combating illegal alcohol vending at numerous events. Moving forward, staff's recommendation is to continue the pilot program and the ordinance amendment through the entire 2024 season of both NFL and non-NFL events and return to speak with you in spring 2025. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. Oh, thanks. I'm yeah. just like looking at the badge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you like to stay there in case there's questions? Um, Council Member Jane. Thank you very much, Captain Fitting. Um, I heard reports that the vendors are actually being run by some central organization that give carts out to the various people to run these. Um, when you issue like multiple citations, is it to a person or is it to a cart um, to then sort of first you warn them and then later you ratchet it up to a citation? Um, and have you observed uh, people, I think Howard had mentioned earlier, um, that people store the food inappropriately. It's not refrigerated and such. I know it's the county that's really responsible for maintaining the health concerns, and I think they might have come out once. Do you need them to come out more often to ensure that the public is safe with proper food handling practices, um, and um, I think you said that it's gotten better because the in the report I read, the egress routes are now clear for people to exit in an emergency. Um, uh, is that still being maintained that people know where to be um, so that they don't block egress? Thank you. All right, Council Member Chahal. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Captain Fitting, for the report. I'm glad the pilot program is working out well and we are making improvements on this thing. That's good. Uh, I have a question like you did mention whenever we had the county health and ABC enforcement, basically, if they were on the ground, we were in a much better shape. So what would it take to get the county health department and ABC to have more presence on the ground going forward for enforcement? That's my question. Thank you. Um, Council Member Hardy. 
Thank you. Um, I had a similar question. Uh, when I do a food booth at the Art and Wine Festival, that's part of what we pay for, and that's the understanding that the county will be out at least once, possibly more, uh, to check everything to make certain it's correct. By the way, mine's always fine. Um, but I also worried about um, when I saw 35 citations that said sales slash consumption, I was wondering if that was people consuming something that shouldn't have been sold to them or if that was specifically 35 different sales situations over a time. I just, I wondered about that number. And then uh, obviously when I read the report, I was disheartened to see that there was a uh, altercation between uh, a vendor and the police officer. And uh, that to me was unfortunate and wondered if that was just a one-off. Thank you. All right, that's it for the questions. So um, Captain Fitting, if you're able to answer. Yes, thank you for the questions. Uh, regarding p potential you know, orchestrated collaboration for how vendors are individually dropped off or if it's, you know, essentially organized. Um, we do believe that that is the case in certain circumstances. So we will see, let's say, large vans come and potentially unload equipment and people will exit the vans. As far as the actual enforcement, when the, the crime occurs, when the violation of the ordinance occurs, it does come down to the individual. I don't want to speak too much in this environment um, to our investigative protocols and practices for the sensitivity of what does occur. But we have worked to gain intelligence regarding if there is an organized element to this. Um, so I'll leave the response to that for now. Um, do people store the food inappropriately? Um, as you've seen in, in prior examples, and I didn't redisplay the photo of the back of the vehicle with all the hot dogs non-cooled, non, non um, we do believe that is the case for the most part when our personnel have contact with these vendors, at that point they're out you know, at the sidewalk in that environment. So uh, it would be speculation for me at this point. The county did come out, um, and this will speak to a few of the, the questions that came all in one, but our county Department of Environmental Health did come out for three of our 10 events. They were outstanding partners, um, the resource uh, reference from previously was that typically they're not necessarily working weekends and there was not compensation through you know us to them it was them through their county funding and them doing what they do for the county um, I just know that they have limitations on time and personnel and coming out but the, the times that they did come out not only did they educate us but they were supportive of our entire operational plan as far as egress routes being clear, absolutely. That's one of our primary objectives. It's, it's, a, very, it's a critical component to our public safety plan um, for the reasons you would imagine it, with large crowds. So we did see that uh, immediately. Um, it did uh, decrease as the numbers increased, but we're look, looking forward to the pilot project being continued so that we can continue to fine tune this. What would it take to have ABC and the county present Currently, we do have a grant with the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control, so I, I do expect continued support. We already have a verbal commitment that the County Department of Environmental Health will be out for our May 4th event um, as well. So uh, we're gonna continue to nurture those relationships and take those one step at a time. The 35 citations, there was a reference, it was listed that that was consumption, that was for minors that were consuming. So while agents were out there looking for folks perhaps selling unlawfully, um, they did observe other alcohol-related violations. And as for the last uh, comment question regarding uh, the, the one particular interaction, out of the 600 contacts that we had, that was extremely limited and believe it was a one-off. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll go to the public now, Howard. Please come forward. Welcome back. Hi. I'm the guy that uh, is really affected a lot by this street vending since I was the guy who started out there about 10 years ago 
working with the city every way I can to make sure I do everything legal. I did get a visit by the health department this year, and there was two of them that ganged up on me, and they couldn't find nothing wrong with me. My temperatures are cold. I'm serving food at 140 degrees, which they, about 20 degrees more than they care about, but I care more. Um, my area is all clean. I don't leave things laying around where people can get hurt or trip over stuff. So that's one thing that the health department really concerns about is keeping everything cold and clean. Bleach really works good for that stuff. And again, I'm back to thanking these guys for their hard work at creating this, uh, I like to say it's an opportunity for people to go out there and get in that little area and make a little bit of money. All you gotta do is figure out how to do it nice and legal. And these guys set up a way to do it. All, all people have to do is go there and start doing it right. And I like to push for you guys to put this in place for it never goes away. It's the law. <clears throat> Not every six months we go back to look at it and talk about how dirty things are. Put it in place for good. And uh, I didn't beat up all you guys too bad, did I? Thank you. Thank you, Howard. And we don't want people to get sick, so oh. that's the most important thing here. Is there anyone else um, from the public? No one else online? All right, thank you, uh, Council Member Jane. There was uh, one question I had. I think I saw in the report there's a trash issue. Are, are the vendors required to provide trash cans or is the facility, this Manco, responsible for providing trash facilities? Through the mayor. Oh, yes, go. Sure. Um, vendors are responsible for cleaning up their area and ensuring that no trash is left. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the other part of your question, the stadium manager does have a contract with um, uh, vendors as well as personnel that picks up trash in the immediate uh, vicinity of the stadium after, after events. And so both of those things do occur. And oftentimes, I think the public will see red uh, trash cans around uh, the, the, the footprint of the stadium area, even sometimes into the neighborhoods. All right, Councilmember Watanabe, do you have a motion? You read my mind. Uh, but I, before I um, give the motion, I'd like to uh, just thank uh, Captain Fitting and all of the police department for just um, taking this on and because it, it's been very effective and you know and supporting you know our vendors that want to do things legally like Howard uh, you know has been really helpful so I just want to thank you for doing that because I saw myself first I saw myself firsthand uh, you know just the illegal behavior that was going on out there uh, you know before games and uh, so I really appreciate the police department you know taking on this project and so um, and seeing the success of it and I know it's a lot of work but still uh, I really appreciate um, that you have gone to the, this effort um, on behalf of our vendors and our legal vendors uh, so I would like to make a motion to waive the first reading and approve the introduction of an ordinance amending chapter 5.05 of the Santa Clara City Code to readopt the street vending stadium pilot program to run through February 28th, 2025 and modifying section 5.05.430 to include Old Glory Lane west of Great America Parkway. Second. Motion and a second. There's no further discussion. City Clerk, please register your vote. Madam Mayor, if I might, too, while you're voting on that, um, Javon and I were certainly involved with this, but appreciate the acknowledgement of the police department being obviously at the front line, you know, of all this. I'd like to acknowledge Sue Reuter from my group, who's the architect and primary support, you know, for this. 
measure um, and really very valuable uh, work from her and my group. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all of you for protecting the public. We all appreciate it very much. Who gave us a yeah? Somebody said yeah. Okay, very good. I heard a yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, register your vote, please. And that passes unanimously. All right, I'm moving backwards. So we have number seven, public hearing action on an environmental impact report and mitigation monitoring and reporting program, rezone investing tentative subdivision map for the property located at 1957 Prune Ridge Avenue to allow for the development of 22 detached single family residences and associated on and off site improvements. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, tonight's item will be presented by uh, Leslie Xavier, our planning manager, and the item is to consider rezoning investing tentative map for the site located uh, on the northern side of Prune Ridge Avenue, west of Winchester Boulevard, to allow for the development of 22 single family detached homes. Uh, Leslie. Welcome. Thank you, City Manager. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, the request before you this evening, and sorry, I'm going to have to learn a few slides on this. Uh, the request before you this evening is to allow for the development of 22 single-family detached residences. This requires an environmental impact report, mitigation and monitoring and reporting program under the California Environmental Quality Act, a rezone from public quasi-public and public park or recreation to planned development, and a vesting tentative subdivision map to subdivide the property for individual sale on, and for common lots. The subject site is 2.47 acres. It's located on the north side of Prune Ridge Avenue, just west of Winchester Boulevard. Um, the site is currently developed with the former St. Mark's Church complex, which includes a parish, class, classrooms, and the church building. Um, so a little more location uh, context for you. Um, the site is located in the middle there, surrounded by the orange boundary. It is surrounded by single family residences to the north with the yellow dots. Um, commercial buildings to the east and west. So on the west side is um, a one story commercial uh, medical office building. On the east side is a strip commercial retail center. Um, on the south side is Walgreens, um, a multifamily apartment complex, a school, and some more single family residences. Um, and just to note, Winchester Boulevard is the city's um, limit, boundary limit, um, in the center line there. And then just a little bit south of Prune Ridge is the Agrihood project as well as Valley Fair Mall. The site has a general plan land use designation of very low density residential, which allows up to 10 dwelling units per acre and a zoning of the public quasi-public. As you can see, the general plan map is on the left and the zoning map is on the right for reference. The applicant held two community meetings for this project. The first community meeting, the applicant introduced the project and gave the community opportunity to review and comment. Um, the concerns and issues raised at the first meeting included how the property would be maintained, construction activities, site circulation parking, shade and shadow, as well as privacy. At the second community meeting, the applicant presented the changes that they made to the plan, which included um, changes to the dwelling units themselves, the site circulation, and the landscaping, which resulted from the community input from the first community meeting. Um, there was a remaining concern about the driveway location and potential related to congestion at Prune Ridge and Winchester intersection. This is the proposed site plan. Um, again, it's 22 units. There's three floor plan types. The density is 8.9 dwelling units per acre, so under the 10 dwelling units per acre allowed by the general plan. Um, three of the units will be affordable in conformance with the city's affordable housing policy. Parking's provided in um, three-car garages along with a uh, three-car driveway for a majority of the units. There are three units that are two-car garages with a two-car driveway. Access to the site is provided by a single driveway um, on Prune Ridge Avenue, and it's located at the easternmost frontage of the site, so the bottom right-hand corner um, of this slide. Um, there's also a pedestrian for sale located centrally to the project, and um, the maximum building height is 31 feet. The setbacks of the buildings along Prune Ridge are 10 feet, and then the rear setback is 15 feet. 
Uh, the rear units facing the single family rear yards do have um, an 18 foot height limit to the top of the wall and then with a roof sloping from that back towards the front towards Prune Ridge which has a maximum height of 31 feet to the pitch of that roof. And then additionally along the north side adjacent to the single family rear yards there is a landscape buffer. Um, this is a sample of the floor plans. There are three floor plans, but um, a majority of the units fall into um, plan one and plan two. Um, there is a four bedroom, three bath uh, plan, a five bedroom, four bath plan, and then a four bedroom, three bath plan. And these are two story units. This is an example of the elevations of the projects. Um, all the elevations do include a mix of materials, which include batten boards, stucco, stone veneer, asphalt roof shingles, as well as standing seam metal roof. Um, there are varying elevations of each unit that's provided along Prune Ridge Avenue. As stated before, the project does include a tentative subdivision map. Um, this will divide the lot into 22 individual lots for the single family residences, and then provide four common lots um, for open space easements and the drive aisle. Finally, CEQA review. Um, an environmental impact report was prepared for this project. The draft um, EIR and notice of availability were posted on the city's website for 45 days between November 17th, 2023 and January 2nd, 2024. There are no public or agency comments on the draft EIR during this 45 day review period. Um, the EIR identified significant unavoidable project level and cumulative impacts to cultural resources in that the existing church structure on the site was identified as being eligible for listing as architecturally significant for a local structure. Um, to redevelop the site, the structure is to be demolished, which is a significant unavoidable impact, which requires a statement of overriding considerations. All other resource areas um, would experience a less than significant impact with the project development. Mitigation measures, mitigation measures um, included in the EIR will reduce the impacts to less than significant level and are implemented through the mitigation monitoring and reporting program and project conditions of approval. The CEQA resolution makes findings to adopt the MMRP statement of overriding considerations and finding that there exists a certain overriding economic, social, or other consideration for approving the project that justifies the occurrence of the associated impacts. This project was also presented to our Historical and Landmarks Commission um, on December, December 7th, 2023. Um, the HLC did not recommend the church property for listing on the city's historic resources inventory. They did um, recommend that the EIR include the following um, for the developer to create a memorial to the church using the architect William May's name, utilizing materials from the church in the memorial if the church is not relocated, and that the developer return to the HLC to present the memorial design. Um, the applicant was amenable to these conditions and they've been added to the project. Um, this item also went to our Planning Commission on February 21st, 2024. Uh, the Planning Commission voted unanimously to approve the project with the two following added conditions. The developer shall use reasonable efforts to the satisfaction of the Director of Community Development to obtain documentation from the diocese of the previous church site, St. Mark's, regarding the disposition of the human remains and details as to their new location, and to provide a right turn only during peak hours signage for the project driveway. Uh, the applicant was also amenable to both of these conditions and they have been added to the conditions of approval. Um, finally, as to the conditions of approval, at the Planning Commission meeting, the developer did request two changes to the conditions of approval uh, for condition P5, which requires a complete street sidewalk section, which is a sidewalk, a separated sidewalk, landscape strip, and then the right of way. Um, and their reasoning was it wouldn't provide symmetry with the existing neighborhood. And then also condition P23, which memorializes the applicant's voluntary commitment to all electric construction. Uh, for condition P5, since the Planning Commission meeting, um, staff has determined that the city's Prune Ridge Avenue Complete Streets Plan actually doesn't apply to sidewalk design for this area. However, um, staff still recommends uh, requiring complete streets for this project. Um, there is a general plan policy 5.84 P5, which um, states that 
to design streets to include detached sidewalks with planting strips or wider attached sidewalks with tree rails to encourage pedestrian use and safety. Um, so staff recommends still keeping the complete steep condition as a part of the condition of approval. And then finally for condition P23, since the Planning Commission meeting, city staff has worked with the applicant to reword the condition in such a way that's acceptable to both parties. Um, and that reads, in order to be consistent with the greenhouse gas analysis in the project CEQA documents, no natural gas infrastructure should be installed on the project site. If the developer seeks to install natural gas infrastructure in the future, the developer must first seek an amendment to the PD zoning. Um, and with that, staff finds that the project is consistent with the city's general plan, um, land use, residential, and transitional policies, as well as the site's land use um, designation. Uh, the site design and building architecture integrate into the community, contributes to the city's housing supply, uh, provides the required affordable housing units, as well as home ownership opportunities, and recommends that the city council adopt a resolution to certify the EIR and adopt CEQA findings, a statement of overriding consideration, and the MMRP program. Adopt a resolution containing findings to approve the rezoning of the project site from public quasi-public to planned development to allow for the construction of the 22 detached single two-story residences um, and attached and detached garages. And then finally, to adopt a resolution <coughs> containing findings to approve the vesting tentative map to subdivide the site into 22 individual lots with four common lots. And this concludes staff presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now I will go to council members um, for comment. Um, and just to let everyone uh, one know, this is a public hearing and it's open. So here we go. Council Member Becker. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so my question is, and my map isn't loading here, uh, but first question is, is the driveway, it looks like it's gonna be two exits or just one? For, to me, it looks like it's a roundabout if I'm correct. So that was the first question. And then the second question is about the remain, uh, hu human remains on the site. I know that was brought up to me a lot um, before this was you know, moved forward, this project, and a lot of concerns with the neighborhood about that. Uh, I guess I'm trying to understand a little more about the human remains. Is it people that have family that are still here, or is it so ancient that people aren't around anymore? that are related to them. So I'm trying to understand that and where how that would work out in, um, um, I guess, removing the remains and where they'll be put. And then at the same time, whoever's looking to purchase this property, will they be notified that there were human remains located in this property? Thank you. Council Member Hardy. Thank you. Um, my basic questions is when I looked at this, it looked like there was parking on the street still, but I, because they're individual houses, are we looking at just visitor parking in their driveways? I just wondered what, because that, that becomes an issue in developments like this is the visitor parking. I think I heard, and it went a little quick, that the height went up as high as 31 feet. And um, I was curious when you talked about the different, you only talked about two basic uh, floor plans, but how could those floor plans be really high on one, just on one side and uh, on the prunage side and not on the side that backs up to the, to the existing homes? And because it is a sticking detail, I wanted to make certain I understood the sidewalk uh, P5 issue when I read through it, I, complete streets, it's that the developer doesn't want it as wide as the city's asking for it. If that's, I wanna understand the details there a little bit better. Thank you. Council Member Jane. This time Karen asks all my questions. All right, are you so, done then? Um, the width of the sidewalk, <laughs> the bike lane, and on-street parking. And then finally, um, I think by state law, they have solar on the roofs, right? Uh, Councilmember Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I only have one question uh, regarding the, the Prune Ridge entrance. Um, 
and I guess it, it goes along with uh, the fact that they, in order to make a right-hand turn, there's the sign that's going to indicate, you know, only right turn on during peak hours. So I'm wondering, um, because of that, I mean, with cars coming into the property, will there be a special lane or some kind of a, a special turn lane, I should say, uh, in into the property as a result? Thank you. Councilmember Park. Yeah, a lot of <clears throat> some of the questions have already been asked. Um, I did have a question also about condition P5, but I will wait for the other answers. <clears throat> when we talk about modifying condition P23, the condition basically says rather than um, prohibit natural gas, it would be with a an amendment. And if that's the case, it sounds like the developer would be asking for an amendment in the future. Like, why wouldn't they tell us what the plans are instead of keeping this in, you know, kind of in the pocket, making the modification that allows them to ask for an amendment? Um, because it seems like that's asking for an amendment. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it to that. Thank you. Councilmember Becker, uh, wait a minute. Councilmember Chahal. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is related to the height on the back side close to the single family resident. I don't see what is the height because I see 31 feet is the highest in the front probably, but not in the back. And uh, also question is, did we, uh, you know, we were trying to follow objective data and standard of 45 degree elevation so that nothing falls in that. Did we follow that or not? And the height of the... Um, units which are abutting the single family residence. Thank you. Council member, or Vice Mayor Becker, did you have any additional comments? Your light's still on. Yes, I had some more, I had some follow-up questions as well. Um, Council member um, Hardy and Council member, I think uh, Jane uh, mentioned it, which is going back to the parking uh, on site for, as Council member Hardy was asking, what about on the street? Because uh, I know that there is the Prune Ridge uh, bike, the Prune Ridge plan coming up, and how much parking will be removed? Because if you look at the across the street, they have that school, uh, and I know that creates a lot of traffic and backup over there because it's where the lanes actually shift from two down to one. So I'm wondering about the effect on that. And then also, Councilmember Park brought it up, and I kind of was actually a little curious about that too, which I'm glad he asked it, which is about the natural gas. Um, it just seems like, like you said, it's like they're planning that maybe for the future. So is that what the developer's intention is, is that they do want to have natural gas possibly on this site or the ability to be an option for either electric or gas? Okay, those are the questions. Uh, Leslie, do you need more time on those? Um, no, I think I got it. Um, okay. Can I see the slides again, please? I'm, oh. oh, there we go, all right. I'm gonna go back to the site plan. Actually, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna try to use the pointer. Um, so I'm gonna start, uh, Council Member Becker, your driveway question, there we go. Um, so the driveway is loca located here at the, um, the southern, southeastern portion of the site. It is a two-way driveway, it is in and out. So it is 27 feet wide, which is a, a standard driveway width for two cars. So just one exit then? Yes, and this is the only vehicle ac access to the site. Um, there is a hammerhead turnaround for fire access at the other end of the site. And then in the center, there is just pedestrian access only. So um, this hammerhead access for fire does not go all the way through to Prune Ridge. So the only vehicle access is, is right here. Okay, no emergency exit possibilities if that area is blocked. It's just one in and out, and that's correct, it. Correct, correct. Okay. Um, as far as the human remains on the site, um, I'm going to have the applicant speak a little more to that, but there was a concern um, from a community member about what happened to those remains. They've already been removed from the site, um, but there wasn't any information as to where they were removed to. So I'll let the applicant explain a little more about that. They do have some more information for you. Um, and then as far as parking, um, so a number of council members asked the question about parking. There currently is street parking um, in this location. 
Um, when the Prune Ridge Avenue bike improvements come in, that may not be the case any longer. Um, and so the applicant has taken that into consideration. Each house does have a full driveway, so they can park in the three car garages, six cars can park on site. So in the garage, three in the garage, three on the driveway, and then for the two car ones, obviously two in the garage, two on the driveway. Um, so there is that guest access. A, a full car does fit. I know sometimes you see ones that are shorter and the cars stick out, but these are for full cars. Um, all right, so Council Member Hardy, the 31 foot height limit, and there was a couple questions about this. Well, maybe I can explain better. So this is a typical unit. Um, the 31 feet, let me do this again. The 31 feet is to the, the pitch of the roof, the highest pitch of the roof. So the other elements in the front do drop down lower. Um, and I don't have a rear elevation on here for you, but the if you can, sorry, I can't make this work. So if you can see that the front part of the of the house does have a, a lower elevation, the highest pitch is 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 set back a little bit. So that's what I meant by um, being set back from the single family residences. Is the higher pitch is is farther away, where the lower the lower elements of the building are closer. All right. Um, so as far as the the complete streets section. Um, a complete street for the city of Santa Clara is a detached sidewalk. So you have your car right of way, you have a curb, you have a planting strip, and then you have your sidewalk. So the applicant's not, um, is, is okay with the width of the sidewalk, it's just the configuration that they feel that it's more um, in keeping with the neighborhood to keep it as a non-detached sidewalk, um, as the, the neighborhood does to the west of it. Um, there was a question about roof solar. I'll let the applicant answer that question, whether or not they're going to include solar on the roof. Um, as far as accessing the site, again, so there is just the one driveway. It is a right in and um, it's, it's right in, right out, left in, left out. So if you're coming down Prune Ridge and need to make a left into the site, um, you will stop in the lane to make that left. There is no turn lane um, that's going to be provided. So you'll be stopping in the travel lane waiting to make your left-hand turn into the site. Um, as far as the natural gas, I again will let the developer speak to their intent on why they would like to have the ability to do um, gas in the future and not, and, and, um, not just all electric. And then the, the last question I have here is the 45 degree um, height setback. So there is a 15 foot setback to the, the front bit of the structure. So it does meet that, that requirement from the property line um, to, the, to the first bit of the structure and then going back. So it does meet that transition policy. I don't have a diagram to show you that, I apologize. And I believe that covers all the questions. Let me know if I missed some. Madam Mayor, I have one um, addition to um, staff's comments. Thank, thanks for that. Um, and um, speaking to uh, questions regarding condition uh, P23, developers should definitely speak to what their intentions are going forward. But the way that that condition is constructed, um, the intent of it, and I think the effect of it, is to make clear that if, in fact, they were going to do anything other than um, a all-electric installation, they would need to come back and get um, a, a, an adjustment to the zoning. And so it doesn't, they can express their intentions, but it really actually works in our favor and staff's recommendation favor to make clear and the, and the uh, developer is bound by the fact that they, would, they couldn't just do it, they'd need to come back and amend their entitlements. So that's, that's the intent of it and how it, how it would work. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for that. All right, so it's a public hearing. We're going to go to the applicant now. Welcome. Thank you. Um, do you guys have my presentation? Uh, will you guys pull that up? I'll get started. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council, City Staff, uh, residents in the audience or watching from home this evening. Uh, my name is Corey Kusich, and I'm representing SCS Development in the proposed project located at 1957 Prune Ridge Avenue. Um, 
I had a full presentation. I'll go through it really quickly and cut some things out because Leslie did a great job covering some stuff, and then I'll, that'll also allow me a little bit more time to address some of your guys' questions and comments. Um, but before I get into the specific project, I just want to provide a quick overview on SCS development. Our founder and CEO, Stephen C. Schott, has long ties to the city of Santa Clara. He attended and played baseball at Santa Clara University, in which he's become a major philanthropic donor to over the years. Um, his son and vice president of SES Development, Stephen E. Schott, who's here this evening with us, uh, also attended Santa Clara University. Uh, Stephen C. Schott's father was actually the very first city engineer for the city of Santa Clara. And actually, uh, just the other week when we were looking at old plans for this specific project, we pulled up an old track map from the 50s, and his father's signature was seen on the map as a city engineer, which was pretty cool to see. Um, our office is located in Santa Clara uh, on Prune Ridge Ave or on Saratoga Avenue, but right next to Prune Ridge Golf Course, and actually no more than a half mile away from this project. Uh, and over the past couple years, uh, we have built many great projects in the city of Santa Clara. Most recently, Tuscany Apartments, which we built and still own, and Catalina One and Two, both townhome projects right around the corner uh, from here on El Camino. Um, so as you can see, we have long ties to the city of Santa Clara. And we pride ourselves on working with the city and the surrounding communities uh, to cre create the best projects possible. Um, this is the site location, as you guys are well aware from the press presentation, so I will skip this slide. Um, shown here is the proposed site plan. The site is approximately 2.5 acres and general planned as very low density for a maximum of 10 units per acre. We're proposing 22 single family uh, homes with an approximate density of 8.9 units per acre. Three of those 22 single family homes will be built and sold as below market rate units. Uh, originally, we had proposed a loop street with two locations for ingress and egress onto Prunerich Avenue. In coordination with uh, planning and public works, we were able to reconfigure the site with a singular point of access and a hammerhead turnaround. Uh, to address your question earlier, that hammerhead turnaround can also be uh, used as an EVA uh, in case of an emergency. Uh, this provided a more private street configuration for the community while also promoting safer vehicular traffic. Uh, and as the previously proposed second ingress egress uh, was very, is very close proximity to Crestview Drive. Um, as you can see, these single family homes have been designed and configured similar to many townhouse developments in which all of the garages are double loaded and accessed off the singular loop street while all the front doors are facing outwards. This layout creates the most scenic street frontage along pretty much pos as possible without the visibility of garages, which will be shown in the next couple of slides. Uh, the front doors are all accessible via a lush landscape pathway throughout the development. And lastly, at the center of the site, you'll see a large bioretention area to treat all storm water for the development. Uh, the redevelopment of this site will not only treat all storm water runoff, but will result in less impervious surface area in the site's previous use, uh, which is great in the natural, uh, restoring the natural collection of groundwater. Um, so in the next couple slides, I'll show the uh, re architectural renderings. So these specific renderings are shown along Prune Ridge Avenue. The units along the project's frontage have been enhanced with a combination of unique designs, materials, and colors. Along the project's frontage, each unit has its own individual look due not only to the use of different colors and materials, but additionally due to varied roof lines, covered patios, and balconies. Additionally, each unit along Pruden Ridge has fenced in front yards uh, with landscaping throughout, creating a nice space for gathering and interacting with neighbors and the community. And this area just shows the bioretention area at the center of the site with the pathway that goes to the units along the back side of the property. And so, these are the units on the back side of the property. Uh, during our two community meetings uh, for this project, in consistent engagement with the community, uh, specifically the residents along Wood Woodland Avenue that back up to this project, we uh, quickly realized that privacy was their main concern. Therefore, we specifically redesigned the back houses multiple times to create as much privacy for them as possible. Unlike the units along the frontage, the back units do not have any covered patios, balconies, or fenced in front yards. Our goal with this was to eliminate any space for outdoor gathering along the property line to promote privacy for the neighbors. Uh, a question about the roof heights. So along the back side of the property, most of the roof heights at the tallest point are 29 feet. And again, that's at the central portion of the building. As you get closer to the property line, that drops off at about a 45 degree to approximately 20 feet. 
additionally, the roof lines along the backside of the property have been reconfigured to dampen and reduce the impacts of the new residential development to their surrounding neighbors. Between the garages, uh, there's a centralized courtyard unit within each unit. These spaces are, perf are perfect for outdoor dining, entertaining, and gathering while keeping all of the outdoor noise centralized. This is just your typical floor plan, which I'll, I'll skip because Leslie had covered these. Uh, so quickly, just to discuss a couple project benefits, uh, we're providing 22 opportunities for new single family home purchase in an area that is in dire need for more housing opportunities. Uh, we are providing three new single family homes within the subdivision that will be made uh, available at a below market rate price. We'll be making a payment of over uh, $62,000 per unit, approximately $1.4 million for the entire project for parkland dedication. And as I previously mentioned, we'll be uh, reducing the amount of impervious surface area from the site's existing use. Um, so lastly, um, you know, we agree with all of the planning department's recommendations and the staff report. Uh, apart from the following condition, this is regarding the sidewalk. I won't read the whole thing. Um, but you know, essentially, and first and foremost, it's not that we have an outright objection to this condition. If it's the city council likes to see this, we're happy to do so. Uh, we rather just wanted to bring this item up for discussion to allow the city council the opportunity to decide what is most appropriate for this specific project location. Uh, we've done many separated sidewalks in the past. For instance, just out here at Catalina 1 and Catalina 2, we did separated sidewalks. Um, and we didn't have an issue there because that was along El Camino Real. You guys had completed the El Camino Real specific plan. And the majority of these parcels are larger parcels that will be redeveloped. So in the future, there will be one cohesive separated sidewalk, which will look very nice. Um, however, this project on Prune Ridge is, is a completely different situation from city border to city border, essentially Winchester to Lawrence Expressway along our side of the property, the entire sidewalk is monolithic. And uh, the vast majority of these properties are single family homes, which will never be developed. It's nearly impossible for a developer to buy 15, 20 single family homes to make a viable project without people wanting to sell or holding out, et cetera. Um, so therefore, to create a unified sidewalk along Prune Ridge from the very beginning of this process, we thought it was best to have a monolithic sidewalk rather than being the only section on Prune Ridge with a, with a separated sidewalk. Uh, the last thing that I want to note on this is, you know, they're virtually the same cost for us to construct. We're going to be doing a new sidewalk regardless. So there's no financial uh, incentive for this objection. Uh, we just felt it was most appropriate to create symmetry with the existing community and wanted to give you guys the opportunity to discuss this matter and, and have your opinion heard. Um, so that's the conclusion of my presentation. And then with the, with the last two minutes, if it's all right, I'm just going to address uh, a couple of things. Um, so for the human remains, uh, these were cremated ashes that were in burlap sacks that were put uh, in there about or on the site about 60 years ago. So this was kind of an, an issue to us prior to purchasing the property. So before we purchased the property, the Episcopal Church uh, had relocated, uh, the, picked them up and relocated those off site. Um, during the planning commission meeting, a gentleman who I believe is in the audience this evening, uh, brought up his concerns, so we uh, reached out to our contact at the diocese, a member who was uh, on the chair, and he sent me an email actually just last night. I forwarded it this morning to our planner who I did not know was out today. I also spoke with the gentleman this morning to let him know that they've been moved to St. Jude's Church in Cupertino, and that Bishop Lucida Ashby had created or had done kind of a memorial service. They've been placed in the memorial garden, and there's a, a cross from St. Mark's Church there to commiserate the, the memorial for that. Uh, and then lastly, in regards to the natural gas, um, there's been some, I, I, the city attorney might wanna, uh, could probably update you better than I could, um, but there's been some recent uh, court cases, specifically one in Berkeley, that had kind of overturned this, this ruling. Uh, the city of Santa Clara has, still has their reach codes in place. But if that were to change in the future, we may consider using gas or installing gas here just for stoves, for cooking, because it's, you know, our marketing people say it's much better. Um, and so if that opportunity presents itself, that's something that we, we may consider. Um, is there anything else that I missed? I, I think that's it. So if you guys, oh, solar. Uh, yeah, quickly, solar. So whatever your guys' reach codes require, I know uh, about two years ago, it was to have everything solar ready. I believe now it is solar uh, panels. So whatever it is, you know, we have to comply with that as a condition of approval. 
Um, so if there are any questions, I'm here, Steve Schatz here, and our engineers uh, also here via Zoom. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. So this is a public hearing. I'm gonna go to the public. Do we have any member of the public that would like to speak on this issue? If so, please come forward. Hello, welcome. Good afternoon, I mean, good evening. Good evening. Mayor Mayhem, yeah. members of the council. My name is Chris Sarbach. I live in the area. I've known several people who were members of uh, St. Mark's Church. And uh, I'd like to just start off by saying I'm a retired planner, so I understand the planning process. And one of the most important things with the planning process is that you describe the project accurately. So much of what, I, what you're gonna hear from me today is not in the EIR. The NOP was issued and I was the only person in the world that submitted written comments on the EIR. And I, from the start, said, what about the, the, the remains in the church? That there's still nothing in the ER that says there was a cemetery on the site. The cemetery was called the Memorial Garden, the St. Mark's Memorial Garden Cemetery. Right there, I'll go down one second here. Show you a picture. Here's a picture of the church. To the left is a sculpture of a Celtic cross. This is where most of the remains were placed. There are other remains around the church, which was not mentioned tonight. I'm not going to mention those because I'm afraid somebody's going to go out there and, and take them. This is another picture of the cemetery. These are the headstone plaques for each of the individuals buried in, in this location, right here. And th this is just a close-up of what we know. This particular person is uh, Marion Pendergast. Died 2018. So these weren't buried 50 years ago. Pretty recent. Second. Well, that's one thing. This is not, none of this is mentioned in the EIR. And that's a, that's a historical cultural significance in an EIR. Many churches here have that. I won't go on, but there's also a garden. It's called a, a meditation garden. It was done by Margie Richards, who was an artist, a member of the parish. Just very quickly. I'll let you finish because there was some time for you to get your documents together. Eight little, she created these clay tiles. And they have pictures. The first one is the creation. Then the next one is the covenant. Next one is the laws and the prophets. So it's like the, the old, and then and the last one, the last one is the resurrection. So forth. All right, thank you, sir. If say you, more if you had questions. Today. If you'd like to give those documents, if you'd like to share them with our city clerk, then we sure. can see them as well. All I would say is, how can you approve something that's incomplete? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Do we have anyone else that would like to speak? If so, please come forward. Please, um, well, let's wait. Oh, you, you get a chance to answer. Um, is there anyone online, City Clerk? Yes, we have people online. Is that? Anjali Nanda Havis. Anjali? She just lowered her hand. Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Anjali Nanda Havis. I'm the developer um, at with Capital Partners, and we're developing a couple properties in Santa Clara right now. I was told that this meeting um, I was told to attend to speak on behalf of the natural gas issue, which it appears perhaps the developer is not taking up so much uh, right now. Um, I wasn't really given that clear memo, but I'll still come to speak on it. Um, I guess I just really wanted to direct my comments more to the city attorney uh, regarding the legal issue here of prohibiting natural gas. As the developer spoke on, there was that case that uh, came out of the Ninth Circuit's Court of Appeals that overturned the ordinance on the prohibition of natural gas based on um, the issue of preemption. And 
whether or not these cities uh, and the state has jurisdiction on this issue, and they unanimously, unanimously found that the state and cities do not. And so, for example, for my project and also for this project, the REACH codes are telling us that we cannot have natural gas. And my argument to the city is that there are counties now, since the decision, such as Contra Costa and San Mateo, that have halted enforcing uh, these REACH codes or these provisions after that decision because that decision now stands. And the Supreme Court has not taken up the, the case, meaning that that stands as the present law. And that the city of Santa Clara is clearly preempted from enforcing this ordinance on the preemption, or excuse me, on the prohibition of natural gas. And so I guess I'm here to say that I've cautioned the city that I think you're taking on a lot of liability and perhaps a lot of money in future litigation if you continue to enforce these reach codes based on that decision out of the Ninth Circuit. And I think you have a clear jurisdiction issue, and it was clearly presented in that case that you are preempted from enforcing this ban. And that it's so anyway, that's my piece on natural gas. And I'd also like to congratulate the, congratulate the developer on what appears to be a great new project for the city of Santa Clara. Thank you, Anjali. Do we have anyone else? City clerk? All right. Um, so I'm going to ask that we close the public hearing now? Or do I wait until the, I know I was gonna give him an opportunity, but I, do I close the public comment now? After that, okay. So now the uh, applicant has five minutes to answer anything you may have heard that you feel like you need to answer or add anything else um, that you think we should know. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll, I'll just take 30 seconds. I know it's uh, getting late and you guys take as much as item. time as you like. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to add on the on the created uh, ashes, you know, which have been removed um, is that we also have a mitigation measure which requires up to us to have an archaeologist on site uh, during any ground disturbing activities. So if anything, you know, the church has notified us that everything has been removed. But if something is to be found, you know, we'll have someone on site to take care of those appropriately. Um, so that's just an extra caution that we have as well. So I just wanted to bring that to your guys' attention. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Now I close the public hearing. Mm, no, sorry, sir. Motion to close the public hearing, is there a second? We have a motion second to close the public hearing. Please register your vote. And that passes six to one. All right, um, Council Member Becker. Thank you, Mayor. So yeah, um, it's kind of this, uh, what the gentleman brought up from the public is kind of exactly the same things that I was hearing. I wanna know a specific number. I mean, how many remains were actually on this site? I know you mentioned one, but I've heard it was several because also I heard the same thing of it being called the St. Mark's Memorial Garden Cemetery. So I just wanted to make sure and confirmation of how many remains are actually on this site. Is if someone staff, can um, answer that. Available, to, available. Excuse me, sir, please. Turn on the mic. Uh, staff actually doesn't know how many remains were on the site prior to them being removed. Does the applicant? I know you mentioned it already, but can you as they say were it again? they were removed before we purchased the property? I, I'm also unaware of how many remains were there, but as of us purchasing the property, there have been there's zero. So okay, I apologize. He does know because he has a lot of history on this going way back. Okay, thank you. So thank you for answering the questions. Um, you know, I had a lot of people come to me about this project, you know, before this was even on the radar. Um, when, this, when this, actually when the church left, uh, I had a lot of people reach out to me from different faiths, uh, looking at it as options to purchase for themselves for uh, uh, places of worship. Um, that was kind of a, a big subject, you know, matter discussion, as well as the remains on the site. I know that kind of bothered me, but the fact that I'm hearing no one knows the actual number is kind of concerning to me. Um, 
on top of that, there's a few other concerns I've had about the entrance and getting in and out. I do know that most locations do have the ability of getting in and out, but it does concern me. Um, there's a lot of questions I have about this project that I still just don't feel like that were answered. Um, and I do see that the member of the public had a lot further concerns. And that was a lot of the things that I was hearing uh, when I was talking to residents in that neighborhood. So just a lot of concerns. All right, anyone else? Council Member Hardy. Thank you. I was thinking about the sidewalk reality and thinking about most most of the, I walk around a lot, <laughs> and most of the sidewalks, they do come right up to the edge and we do not have that extra. I was thinking of mine and most of the ones I've walked and I was remembering that is correct for uh, that side of Prune Ridge. So I don't, I like the idea of it being more uniform. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I too was aware of the, the Ninth Circuit Court ruling and wondered if our city attorney has a comment on that. City attorney? Yes, Madam Mayor, um, council members. Um, I, I know city council is generally aware of the issue because we've provided some briefings to you on that. That is not actually before you tonight in terms of what kind of policy you make in light of the uh, developer's accommodation and inclusion, you know, in that, in, in his project, based on the fact that those issues were kind of analyzed and necessary as part of the CEQA review. Staff's currently evaluating, um, you know, the, the condition of our existing ordinance and um, to the extent there are issues with it, we're, we're working on developing a, um, a, a way to improve the ordinance um, in ways that uh, um, keep it in compliance with a new evolving applicable law and though to also develop a standard that would also continue to achieve, uh, you know, this city's climate um, mitigation objectives as well. So that's something that you'll be hearing about from staff, both the legal and, and my, from my group and planning staff are working on that. And that will be addressed in a more comprehensive you know, manner going forward, but not in front of you tonight with this project um, in light of uh, developer and staff able to work out what that condition should be. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Park. So <clears throat> I'm hearing that remains were in burlap sacks. I don't know. It sounds like we have headstones and we have names of some of the remains that were there. Um, I was also, I also heard that we moved or there was some of the remains were moved <clears throat> to another location. And is it possible to do a cross check on what was moved, where, who, you know, what was moved, if there's historical records, if any, we could, we could check. Um, because, I mean, the issue is if there is another, if there are more remains found, like what, what would you do? You have an archaeologist there, but what would the archaeologist do? Note and file that there were more remains found? I don't, I don't know what would happen if, if that were the case. Like so. If you speak, you have to come up to the microphone. Okay, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear that. I have, I have I have no great love of asking all the questions first and not hearing responses in real time. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council, Shannon George with David Powers and Associates. We prepared the environmental impact report um, per state statute and the mitigation measures in the EIR. If uh, human remains are found on a site, the archeologist then notifies first the coroner's office and they make a determination if they're, they are recent remains or historic remains. And then based on that determination, then the proper protocol is followed to um, address those remains on the site and, and what happens next. So it is actually the coroner's office who takes the first lead in that once it's discovered. Okay, and if they're, if they're not recent remains, then where does that go? I mean, would coroners go to historians? What would they do? If they're historic, then the tribes are notified and the most likely descendant is identified and they get to choose what happens to the remains. Okay, and if they're uh, remains of people who are not natives, I mean, people who were buried there with, with headstones, what happens in those cases? 
as I said, the coroner's office would make a determination and then they would have to follow whatever procedure they have. I would assume they would try to find the most um, you know, recent descendants of that person to make determination of what would happen with the remains. Understood, thank you very much. Thank you. So I also wanna note <coughs> that, I mean, we talked about 31 feet and you stated, and my question was lower elements of the design are close to the residence, but the side close to the residence is lowered, but not by much. And I think you stated it's 29, 29 feet and that's at the peak. And when I take a look at the pictures, it's like, it doesn't seem to be much of a, a savings at all. Like I, I look at the design and it's pretty squarish and there is that peak that's there, but you've still got 29 feet, you know, two feet lower than the, the highest you know, in the, the secondary peak on the other side. But it's not much of a savings. It's like, well, I'm gonna give you a couple cents off. Won't necessarily cover tax. Um, <clears throat> I have concerns about egress. I think that counts, uh, Vice Mayor Becker also mentioned it, which is I look at the original design. The original design looks like it has a one-way entrance and one-way uh, exit, but there's, there's two places. Um, my question is, you said that, that the hammerhead turnaround becomes an EVA um, during emergencies, but why not continue the hammerhead turn to the street and just make it a, a standard egress? I, I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. Um, I hear your, your comment about making a monolithic sidewalk because it, it looks more consistent with, with what's there, but I'm looking at, well, the other neighborhoods, we're gonna see what the, the bike, bicycle, bicycle improvements will do. But in this case, I feel like <clears throat> if it's the same cost and one seems like it could be safer than another or a better walking experience, why wouldn't we do the better walking experience? Like I have no problem with going with the commercial or the retail that, you know, bookends your site and switching to something that Oh, makes me realize I've, I'm in a different part of the neighborhood now. I'm, I'm in a residential place. I have no problem with that. And I think that as the, maybe the retail sites get redeveloped, because it seems like that's the way everything's going, maybe they would also be more consistent with what we think is better, looks nicer, or is better for pedestrians and bicyclists, you know, having that separated walkway. Um, I have a few more questions, but I think they're, they're largely asked. Thank you. Is there any more comments from the city council? All right, I want to just opine in on the project. I think it's a really great project. I like the fact that it's a single family residential for sale project um, on Prune Ridge Avenue. I also live in District 6. I've talked to a lot of people in the area and there's a reason you don't see massive disapproval here in the chambers tonight because the developer has done a very good job um, engaging the community, surrounding the community. Um, I'm happy with the um, safeguards uh, if there are um, any remains on the property that the project would be stopped in its tracks and the protocols would be put in place if there is. So if there are, um, um, you know, bodies or remains there, you, you gotta, you have to remove them. There's no, there's no doubt. And yes, you have to disclose if there are anything there. It's a huge risk and liability. So that's not taken lightly at all. And so I'm, I'm happy with that. I'd like to see the unified sidewalk because I do walk in that area a lot and it's gonna look strange and just off if, if it's separated, I don't think it's a difference in cost, but I think for the aesthetics of the neighborhood, and it is surrounded, even though there's commercial there by single family residential, and this is our new single family residential. Some may say it's, you know, it certainly could be a high density development there, which the neighborhood would not like at all. Uh, Multi-stories, and I think this is the best um, uh, product that can be put in that location. Um, we have the developer who has a history here in Santa Clara, a long and rich history uh, that has developed a product that is, has done very well over the test of time. 
and I have no doubt that these single family homes would do well. It's a product that is not often out there. We're always approving high density residential rental units and this is a, a diversity of uses that I think is really needed, especially in that area. I like the fact that it has um, the full garages and the full you know, parking um, driveways to park all the, uh, all of the guests as well because that neighborhood is also, um, it has a lot of cars after, after five o'clock in the evening. There's a lot of cars because there's big lots and big houses there and they sometimes have multi-generational families in the houses. But I think it's a, it's a great use and it's one that the neighborhood accepts and uh, I think it's the best use we can put there. So I'd like to see a motion that approves this project. Council Member Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I would like to just reiterate a couple of the um, comments that you made. Um, I agree. Uh, I feel like the um, the homes are built, will be built in such a way that there's little intrusion into neighboring uh, neighborhoods and um, that uh, there, some of the concerns that have been addressed or uh, brought up that um, the staff is ready uh, and has taken precautions uh, to deal with them uh, if these concerns uh, do come up at another time. Um, I feel like this is a great project in, in a good area and um, I like your reference to the high density, that would definitely not work in this area, but um, it'll fit in nicely in the, in the neighborhood. So I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to uh, adopt a resolution to certify the environmental impact report and adopt the CEQA findings statement of overriding considerations and mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the 15, 1957 Prune Ridge Avenue residential project to adopt a resolution to approve a rezoning of the project site from public, quasi-public, and public uh, park or recreation to plan development uh, PD to um, allow construction of residential development consisting of 22 detached two-story residences with attached and detached garages, landscaping, and on and off-site improvements subject to conditions of approval and uh, to adopt uh, a resolution approving a vesting tentative subdivision map to subdivide the land into 22 individual lots and four common lots as a utility corridor, vehicle access, landscape, open space, and bioretention areas to serve the development subject to conditions of approval. Can you I'll add the unified sidewalk as well? I'll second that with a friendly amendment of uh, calling out, uh, it was called P5, not requiring the the separated sidewalk, but uh, the monolithic to keep the continuity. And I will say uh, the other reason to second that is I think that uh, the developer was very understanding with our reach code goals, but understanding a reality of we're in no man's land over, over a legal situation and I like the compromise of saying they will keep that with uh, possibility down the road. And as you suggested, it was would it only be for um, ovens. So thank you. Uh, Maker of the okay. motion, do you accept that? Yes, that's okay. fine, thank you. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, city Manager. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor and Council. I just wanted to make sure that we have a clarification for the record. Um, uh, the site does meet all ingress and egress standards. There was a question or a concern, I think, raised by Council Member Becker about one way in, one way out. Uh, the developer clarif uh, clarified and stated that the Hammerhead is an EVA, emergency vehicle access area. Uh, I think in uh, Council Member Park's comments, he stated that uh, that area can be open to be accessed by the street and inquired why doesn't that uh, be open at the entire time. I just wanna make sure that the council is understanding that that hammerhead is blocked by a transformer, and so a vehicle will not be able to access to the street. I just wanna make sure that that's clear for the record, uh, but the site does meet all ingress and egress standards, uh, and it is in fact an EVA. Thank you. Uh, council Member Jane. Yeah, I actually prefer the planting strip along the street because I think it really does help to increase the canopy 
and reduce the heat island effect. Um, it shades the black asphalt of the street and it actually reduces, makes it a much more comfortable street to live on. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Beck, uh, Vice Mayor Becker. Thank you, Mayor. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I live in District 6 as well and I also represent it. And funny thing is, is that, you know, I hear neighborhood, neighbors in that neighborhood had a lot of concerns, not only about this project, but what was gonna happen to this spot of, you know, where it might've been a former place of worship. Um, it's funny because the thing down the street, you know, I know that was mentioned about, oh, neighbors could have had high density. Well, down the street, San Jose is proposing a giant tower that's gonna be built right next to that uh, veterinary clinic. So that is something that's on my radar because Santa Clara residents are asking me to go and try to communicate with San Jose on not having that. Well, we'll see how that works out. Um, the biggest thing I see in this neighborhood is, you know, it kind of reminds me of the development that was approved over on Pomeroy where we had small, small space and we put as many places as we can into one spot and then basically one in, one in and out and having a issue with traffic in the mornings. I do see consistently in that neighborhood school traffic. Uh, that area on the corner there is where the lanes do shift from two lanes down to one. Uh, it's kind of a disaster. That's why I was really asking about a second entrance or an exit, uh, just because of that reason. Uh, I do see the backup happen during the rush hour period. Uh, so that was one of my big concerns. Um, Another one that was also was about the remains that consistently was a issue for me over the time that I spoke to residents in the community about it. Um, and you know, maybe it's just, I've seen too many horror movies, but it just, it just kind of, it's kind of, I know, it's kind of a, a very interesting thing that if I was somebody that wanted to be a homeowner, I don't know, I would want to know about that too. Um, so because of a lot of these reasons, I just, you know, I see a lot of concerns. I spoke to a lot of the neighbors in that area um, yes, it's not high density, but it, you know, we can't all get what we want. Uh, but the concerns to me are over the traffic, over what we're, what, what we're taking from what where we had a church where we had service maybe once or so a week. And then we also had a horseshoe where we had people driving in and out to use the schools on the side. It wasn't as, um, traffic impacted, but again, so because of these reasons, I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Councilmember Park. Yeah, I'd like to thank the city manager for clarifying the hammerhead because it was just a question like if you've got it there, why not go all the way through? But the transformer, I don't know if how easy it is to move the transformer, especially since you're <clears throat> redoing the entire lot anyway. It looks like there's a lot of places where a transformer could be moved if that's an option, right, to make the egress. I mean, I see places here that dead end, you know, even the place in the back. I don't know if you want people walking there, but it just seems like something could be done to make this better. I, again, with, with the Ninth Circuit rulings and things like that, I could see uh, putting the conditions of approval, modification to condition P23, I think Council Member Hardy mentioned that. <clears throat> I think that um, with the city attorney's input as well, I think it's just nice to have that in there so that we know what's happening with that site. It comes back to us. Um, and I will you know, reiterate Councilmember Jane's thought about having the separated, the complete street sidewalk section. Like I understand what the mayor said about, well, it makes the walking uh, consistent. But again, I'm looking at what makes the development better, what makes the sidewalk better, what makes the biking experience better, especially since we know that a bikeway is gonna go there. And for this reason, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, you know, to put in the, um, to, to leave in condition P5, right? And then, so I'm say, saying, I don't know what the motion is, but I wanna leave in condition P5 and modify condition P23. I want to make sure that those are part of the motion. If those, um, what is the modify condition P twenty three? I don't understand what 
what you're asking, uh, Councilmember Park. Can you? Well, it explain, says recommendation please? conditions of approval. Applicant has request to move condition P5. This is slide 14 on the staff's. And we have that in the motion, wasn't that? It was so already in the motion, so. Condition that was modified and agreed upon by the applicant, and it was so it's it part there. of one of the slides. Of, isn't it part of our motion right now? It is. No. It is oh, part of the motion. Correct. I thought then, you were asking then, for something different than no, 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 the motion. And I want to make sure because I wasn't clear. It's in the motion. Which is um, keeping condition P five in. Okay. With. with uh, uh, with the separated sidewalk, not the monolithic sidewalk. That's what he's expressing, Madam Mayor. Do a substitute motion. So let's, let's, I think from what I'm hearing that there might be approval with the separated sidewalk. So, and I think it doesn't matter to the developers at all. So maybe we, I'm gonna ask the maker of the motion if you just take out the monolithic sidewalk and put in the separated sidewalk, I think we might have consensus here. <laughs> Forget the sidewalk. <laughs> the moving sidewalk. If that's okay with the first and the second, it looks like it's okay with the second, we might have some consensus here. Okay. Go for it. All right. Um, I don't see anything else. City Clerk, we have a motion which is staff recommendation. Right. Correct? Staff recommendation, staff one, recommendation. two, and three and right. maintain condition P5. Correct. All of that, and we went back to staff recommendation. All right. When you're ready, city clerk. Please register your vote. Councilmember Park. Please register your vote. Can you just say what you want, how you want to vote? Oh, there you, Councilmember Park, so we can move on. Hello? Could you please tell us how you'd like to vote so we can move on? There we go, six to one, it passes. Thank you very much, congratulations. All right, um, I'm gonna ask for a 10 minute break. I'm sorry, just for our staff and everyone. So right now it's 9.54 at 10.06, thank you. We've got six and nine.
please take your seats. Are we all right, Nora? To go. All right, we're gonna go to item number six, which is a public hearing, consideration and action on the 2024-2025 draft annual action plan for the use of federal housing and urban development grant funds, and it's a public hearing. I'll declare it open. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, each year, the city must prepare an allocation plan for available federal community development block grant, often referred to as CDBG, as well as federal home funding. <coughs> Together, these funds amount to over $2.8 million for the upcoming fiscal year. These funds can be used for a variety of public services and capital projects, as long as they are primarily used to serve low and moderate income residents. Tonight is the first of two required public hearings for the 2024-25 Annual Action Plan. Tonight's presentation will be provided by Adam Marcus, the city's Housing and Community Services Manager. Adam. Thank you, City Manager. Welcome, Adam. All right, good evening, Mayor. City Council, Adam Marcus, Housing and Community Services. Tonight's hearing, I'll share a little bit of background on our federal entitlement programs and some details on our proposed annual action plan. Public comment and city council direction tonight will help staff finalize the plan for the second hearing in May. As you may recall, the city receives a formula allocation of funds every year from two federal programs. The Home Investment Partnership Program, or HOME for short, can be used for rental assistance, security deposits, for low-income people, and for rehabilitating affordable housing. The program is flexible and can be used as a grant or a loan. The Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, uh, for short, is intended to improve housing, create suitable living environments, and expand economic opportunities for low and moderate income persons. And CDBG can be used for construction of public facilities and improvements, public services, rehabilitation, energy conservation, relocation and demolition, economic development, and administration. To use CDBG funds, we must ensure they're meeting at least one of the, na of the three national objectives, which include uh, benefiting low and moderate income persons, preventing or eliminating slum or blight, and meeting urgent community development needs. 70% of CDBG funds must benefit low and moderate income persons, and capital projects must clearly serve low income residents or be located in specific census tracts with a concentration of lower moderate income Before we discuss the details of the proposed annual action plan, it's important to note that this will be the fifth and final year of our federal funding cycle. The city adopted the 2020-2025 consolidated plan, which set broad community development goals for the city. Each annual action plan implements these goals. Later this year, we'll begin outreach on the new 2025-2030 consolidated plan, and that will be a great opportunity to adjust uh, or tinker with any of the city's goals for the next cycle of, of federal funding. The proposed action plan for the upcoming year includes recommendations for CDBG home and general fund dollars. The plan requires a 30-day public comment period that will begin April 5th and end on May 7th uh, at the second public hearing. We typically receive our, our actual entitlement amounts in March, yet due to the federal budget process, announce have, um, announcements have been delayed. For reference, last year we received a little over a million dollars in CDBG entitlement funds and uh, 437,000, uh, sorry, I'm missing a little digit there, $580 for the home entitlement. On this slide, we have a summary of resources that are available 
to program or to use. On the left, for CDBG, we have just over 1.8 million in community development block grant, grant funding. This number includes our annual allocation, unspent funds from prior years, and program income. On the right-hand side, for the home program, we anticipate approximately $1,025,000, which again includes the annual allocation, prior year funds, and program income. This donut shows how staff recommends allocating the estimated CDBG funding that is available. Keep in mind this chart combines all of it, so the annual allocation plus the prior year funds plus the program income. The orange slice represents funding for affordable housing improvements in the neighborhood conservation and improvement home repair program, uh, which includes loan programs for big projects and grants for small projects. The dark blue slice represents public services. Note that 15% of the service cap is applied to a smaller number, uh, which is just the entitlement and program income, not the prior year funds. The light teal slice represents public service facility improvements, and the dark teal slice represents administration costs. This slide summarizes the specific public services service projects that would be funded with community development block grants. You can see the agencies listed there and the amounts. These organizations were funded in the prior annual action plan as well. Uh, we have a new program this year, which is uh, to build ADA curb ramps uh, in partnership with the Public Works Department. And for our affordable housing projects, uh, we have uh, funding from CDBG Home and two of the city's local funding sources to fund a variety of programs for rehab, tenant-based rental assistance, and case management supporting that assistance. This slide summarizes specific uses for available home funds. The orange slice is for the rents and security deposits for our tenant-based rental assistance. The dark blue slice is for fair housing services, and the teal slice is for administration. Since we are working with estimates, it is helpful to include contingency language in the annual action plan to save time if adjustments are needed later in the year. If the city receives more program income than expected, staff proposes to add the excess CDBG funding to the NCIP home repair program um, or to fund a capital improvement project for affordable housing, depending on the source of the funding. If we receive less funding, the city council would, be, would need to decide or delegate decision-making authority to the city manager on which programs not to fund. For home funding, if the city receives a higher than expected amount, uh, staff suggests allocating that additional funding to the tenant-based rental assistance program and helping more people. Uh, but if the home program receives less, um, staff suggests reducing that tenant-based rental assistance amount. Each year in May, HUD conducts a timeliness expenditure test for CDBG. They don't do that for home, just for CDBG. In recent years, the city has fallen behind in CDBG capital spending due to pandemic-related drop in demand for the NCIP home repair program. In April of 2022, the city moved to speed up spending by awarding over $2.4 million to six capital projects. These projects have encountered delays in fiscal year 24-25, staff are proposing a new $600,000 ADA curb ramp project and increases to the NCIP home repair program from $352,000 to $500,000 to further speed CDBG spending. Staff will meet with HUD in spring of this year to discuss additional strategies to ensure timeliness for the next test. After tonight's public hearing, we anticipate getting our final allocation from HUD in April or May. We will bring back a revised annual action plan for a second and final hearing on May 7th. And we will submit the annual action plan to the Department of Housing and Urban Development by May 15th of this year. 
And we end with two uh, recommendations. Uh, the first, to approve the 2024-2025 draft annual action plan and direct staff to include public comments in the final version to be presented to the City Council on May 7th of this year, and to delegate authority to the City Manager or designee to execute all agreements and amendments that exceed the City's $250,000 threshold. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, let's see if there are any. Councilmember Jane. Yeah, this is just the first draft. Can CDBG funds be used for basic income? That's my only question. Councilmember Hardy. There we go, thank you. Um, you mentioned the amount you wanted to set aside for curb cuts, which was 600,000. The NCIP amount you mentioned but was not listed on here, I think you said 500,000. <coughs> Especially when we make this final presentation, I think the number should be there. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Chahal. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding the <clears throat> public services distribution, like uh, we allocated Project Sentinel landlord tenant medi mediation services. Uh -huh. Are we uh, monitoring that on a regular basis? How many of our residents are getting that service uh, in the past? Uh, that's my question, like, uh, because I got some resident complaint that, hey, we went there, they didn't even attend to us, they came back um, without any services. So are we doing any monitoring on that? Thank you. <clears throat> and that's uh, Councilmember Park. Yeah, I have a question about public services as well, meaning is the public service allocation lower because of the applicants or is it because that's how we've we've allocated that money. Like I feel that the services, if we can get much more services, especially, I mean, we look at supportive services, we have a lot of housing projects, we have a lot of other projects, but I think that the partnerships with the supportive services that are required by even people who are living in housing um, that may be facing uh, difficulties, even if they own a house, it's not about a home ownership or rentals. Um, like I would really like to increase the spending there. I also share concerns with Project Sentinel. I remember Project Sentinel um, was involved with some of the some disputes with Mansion Grove when Mansion Grove did its its expansion back in I don't know 2000, 2010, 11, 12, and like I've also heard a lot of complaints, and I wasn't too too happy with that myself. I would like to know if we are monitoring, if we do have reports on resolutions, we have data on you know feedback surveys, uh, people served, what were, their, what were their opinions as well. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Watanabe. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so thank you, um, Andrew. So uh, based on these, um, the projects that are being proposed and the additional numbers, um, will we meet the goal of spending all of the CDBG funding? Because I know there were concerns with that in the past. Adam. <laughs> and that's it for the questions, Adam. If you're I, ready, do you need some extra time or? No, I, th I think I can Okay. Uh, let me start with uh, the first question from Councilmember Jane. Um, I don't know the answer uh, to whether or not it can be used for universal basic income. Um, I would need to check on that. Maybe I can follow up. Uh, the question about the curb cuts. So yes, just to confirm that um, in the report and in the attachment, um, the amount for NCIP loans is 500000 um, and that is an increase over over last year from 352,000. Um, and let's see, okay, the, the question about uh, public services and monitoring for Project Sentinel. So we do collect um, reports and data, and we do report that out in our CAPER every year. So um, I don't have that handy, but we can definitely take a look at the numbers and because every year in their contract we have metrics that we try to achieve and so we can look back and see if they've been um, they've been meeting those I off the top of my head I, I, I don't have those numbers handy but 
we can definitely take a look at the project plan from there. Yeah. And if there's any specific um, complaints, I mean, I haven't heard of any as of late, so please sort of pass those on so we can be aware of those if you know, specific complaints come in. Um, those are good to hear about. Um, and Councilmember Park, so we are limited in increase in, in the amount that we can spend on public services. It, it's, it's statutory, it's 15%. It's um, you know, we always max out on our public service spending with our federal dollars because there's always more demand than there are dollars to give out. So um, the, the bulk of the CDBG money really does have to go to capital projects. Um, so that's why it, it can be, you know, it can be a, a difficult decision sometimes um, on what to fund and what not to fund. And I think the answer there would be, um, you know, to, to, to look for additional sources outside of the federal, um, you know, CDBG realm, um, especially, you know, in the county, the county and the state level, there may be some programs that potentially, depending on what populations you're, you know, the council is interested in serving, um, we could definitely look into that. Um, in terms, and I think I answered your question about data. So again, with each of our subrecipients for federal funding, we do collect, we do collect progress reports every year, and we report that out in the caper. Um, so similar to the question from Councilmember Shahal, uh, we can take a look at uh, Project Sentinel's uh, numbers. Uh, we do not currently um, prepare surveys for clients. Um, but the, the subrecipients do report out to the city. Uh, and then uh, the last question I have here, and if, let me know if I missed any, um, Councilmember Watanabe. Um, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're confident that we can make the goal. So we actually did prepare a very detailed um, <coughs> accounting of what we need to spend specifically. And so if we are able to, you know, the public service dollars, most, I mean, those are, those are always gone at the end of the year. The ones that are a little more complex are the capital projects. And so um, we are, you know, in addition to continuing the programs we're looking to fund that we normally fund with public service dollars, the capital projects that are already in progress, we'll be pushing hard to get those um, into construction um, as early in the fiscal year as possible. And, um, and then we'll be adding other things. So by increasing the amount for the NTIP repair program, um, as well as the new curb cut program. And I, I should mention the curb cut program isn't just for a year. We're looking at making that, or at least ex it's possible for that program to be an evergreen program and that it could diversify the way that we spend our CDBG capital dollars and give us yet another way uh, if there's another disruption like we had with the pandemic. So it, it's not just a one-time thing. There's plenty of need there. And we, we have a great relationship with the Public Works Department. Um, they've been really, really easy to work with. So um, if there's any an unanticipated program income, we can always allocate and, and do more in NCIP loans. So we can look to, uh, but that's kind of another safety valve. So we'll be um, really focused in the beginning of the year trying to get those capital projects moving along. Did I miss any questions? I think you're spot on. Very good, thank you. So this is a public hearing and I'm gonna go to members of the public that have been waiting here all evening. Uh, please come forward. Please run forward if you'd like to speak. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I hear um, you. So good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'm Pilar Furlong. I'm the Chief Community Resources Officer with Bill Wilson Center. Very honored to be here this evening um, to actually encourage your approval of the draft annual action plan for fiscal year 25. Um, so the actual the annual action plan does include the recommendations, right, for the allocation and award of the community development block grants to local agencies, providing services to those residents who are low to extremely low income in Santa Clara. So Bill Wilson Center is once again recommended um, to receive a CDBG grant from the city. And this is in support of our school counseling services for youth and families. So we have had a long time partnership with the city of Santa Clara and it's that ongoing partnership 
that has enabled us to maintain some really strong relationships with our local public schools, with the community, um, so that we're really able to help those in need access individual or family counseling. The families that we serve through this program usually are spending their limited income on food or trying to pay rent and find housing. Um, they don't always have the means to access um, counseling services. So our program addresses a variety of problems that face individuals. We deal with family conflict, substance abuse, depression, anxiety, um, stress. Our counselors really focus on working with the youth to develop the skills that they're gonna need to um, cope with, with some of these problems. Um, we build on their strengths. We look for a no-fail policy so that everybody can succeed. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to the city and to again encourage your approval of the draft annual action plan. So, thank you. Thank you, Pilar, and thank you to the Bill Wilson Center for all the work you provide for our community. We appreciate it. Anyone else that would like to speak, please come forward. Do we have anyone online? I don't see anyone, City Clerk. All right. Um, is there a motion to close the public hearing? We have a motion by Vice Mayor Becker, second by Councilmember Watanabe, to close the public hearing. Please register your vote. And that passes unanimously. Um, do I have a motion for approval of staff recommendation? Motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. Motion and a second for the staff recommendation. Councilmember Park. <clears throat> so Director Marcus, I did have a question. So you said that we have a limit that we can put in. It's the 15% cap for our services because we would like to focus on capital projects. But here, I think you said that we allocate about 10%, a little less than 10% to stay within that 15% cap. So the, the, the pie charts that we showed earlier, are, it's a little confusing because 15% is just of the annual action, but we're actually adding three pieces together to make that pie chart. We're, we're taking the annual, at, at the allocation plus prior year funds plus um, program income. So those three components add into that larger bucket of funding. And so the 15% only applies to um, program, sorry, to the allocation. That's why there are two different percentages. It's a little confusing. In this I case. see, okay, because the, the pie chart that I'm looking for, the donut, it shows 10% of, of that. So we, yeah, we always it, it max out um, on the public service. Okay. Cap. We always try to use it all. Because I could see, especially as we're looking at, you know, what we could do as we become a terminus. I mean, this is years down, but we have to plan for it. And I think that having a pilot program before we simply implement it would be good. But I know in, um, Milbray, which I believe is also um, a, a BART terminus, or they have programs that direct people. They have got navigation centers that where people are coming. I mean, people stay on on public transit till it reaches the end of the line until they have to get off. And to help those people, there are services that say this is where you can go if you're lost, if you're needy, if you're something. We we have places to go. <clears throat> and I would like to see service that could direct them to, like we've got partners like the Bill Wilson Center and we've got you know, other areas, we've got other things that we could direct them to and I just don't see us preparing for that. So I was kind of hoping that there was an additional 5% we can look at, but I understand what you're saying. It's a blended, it's a blended um, bucket, so we are maxing out the 15%, it's just 10% of that particular chart. Thank you very much. All right, so we have a motion and a second. You ready, City Clerk? Please register your vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, staff, Adam, everyone. 
and those who stayed till the end back there. Thank you very much. All right, we have uh, one more item on the agenda, which is item number nine, informational report regarding route analysis for 115 kV transmission line from Northern Receiving Station to Kiefer Receiving Station. Um, Council Member Chahal. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on the recommendation of City Attorney, I'll be recusing on this item. Uh, one of the route option uh, offered is close to my office building. So I'll recuse on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me see. City Manager. Sure. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, as noted, this is an informational report. Uh, and the project that we're talking about is one of the four large capital projects that are needed to accommodate approved and under construction development within the city to provide uh, them with power. As you know, this, this is a very complex project on an aggressive timeline, and so we are periodically coming to you with, an infor with informational reports. There is no action needed tonight. Tonight's presentation will be provided by Chief Electric Utility Officer Manuel Pineda. Thank you. Welcome, Director Pineda. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the council. Pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I do want to introduce the team we have here. We have uh, Alan, Ali, and Albert, who are joining us, who had a, a great Wow, all the role. A's, I okay. Know, I know. Oh, Everyone with I didn't a notice that until right up. now. A plus, A plus, A plus. Stand up. I almost feel like I should leave now. It's like, I don't, I don't. We approve, all yeah. right, go ahead. Um, and also I want to acknowledge that our consultant teams also uh, on Zoom, uh, a couple of members of our consultant team are also on Zoom um, uh, participating in the process. So as the city manager uh, noted, this is an informational item at this point. I just want to note as I'm going through this information that we are still uh, working through many elements of the project. So as I'm presenting, this is the inform best information we have for you today. And I do expect as you see future presentations on this project, changes will happen as the, as the design gets developed. So um, the 115 kV project is a new transmission line that will be built within the city, uh, 2.24 miles that would connect our NRS station to our Kuiper receiving station. As the city manager mentioned, it's a very important project uh, and it helps accommodate both already approved and under construction load growth in addition to providing additional reliability to our system. And we spoke about before about all the projects that are online. I don't have that list in front of you today, but as you know, it's a very significant number of projects that are, that are uh, approved under construction and additional ones that want to come to the city. Uh, it will transfer additional power uh, from the new uh, HDVC line that's coming, uh, high voltage DC line that's coming to the city. As you know, we spoke about that one at length. And if this project doesn't get built, our system operating limit will be greatly reduced. Uh, as I talked about before, we're looking at getting to 1,200, 1,300 megawatts. We're always doing our engineering work to try to get that number as high as we can. And it, 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 uh, it goes up and down a little bit as we go through our work. Without it, we will be limited to about 819 uh, megawatts of, trend, of, um, of power within the city. A lot of key items. We gave you a lot of attachments with a lot of details. Uh, and I'm going to highlight some of the specific ones today. Once again, informational report only, no decisions being made today. From a scheduled perspective, you can tell we've been working on this project for a long time, uh, starting with modeling, planning work before we could even get to where we're at today. Uh, I want to acknowledge, and I'll, I'll go through this at the next steps, the key next steps are coming, but some of the key items to focus on right now will be the CEQA process. They'll come for you at a later date, including the CEQA community outreach. And later on, as we develop a project, uh, we'll be in front of you for procurement, materials, and, and additional elements associated with the project. So we studied three routes. And as I mentioned, there's a lot on the packet, the staff report and the, the attachments. But the key considerations that kind of want to talk about those key routes is feasibility and schedule, how we came down to the route that's the preferred route. And the key part for us is the 2028 completion date. If you look at where NRS, KRS, and SRS are at, they're all within those time frames. If you look at the new transmission line coming from the CAISO, they're still uh, striving for that 28, 28 completion date. So we want to be in the same time frame. I'm starting backwards between A, B, and C because A is the preferred route at this point. Starting with Route C, uh, which you can see in the uh, red, which was not preferred. It would be on the west side of San Tomas Aquino Creek. 
and would replace the existing 60 kV line where available. And really what it comes down to that one is just the easements and permitting would be extremely, extremely difficult and it would be maybe in some cases not feasible to do so. In addition to that, the schedule really would be out of our control even if we pursued that process. Uh, lastly, it is the longest alternative, but my focus on that and the team's focus is just, it is unknown how the permits would work, if they would be feasible, and even if they were feasible, what the time frame would be. And we, we can always talk a little bit more about that if you would like. Uh, route B, uh, very similar to Route 8 in the Fallos Lafayette and Bassett Street. But the difference is it was intended to use uh, UPR right away. Um, we ran it, there's some concerns related to the UPR right away. And certainly not going through every bullet point, but the required extensive easement costs in coordination as well as permits. I can tell you that in a previous life I have worked with the railroad and uh, some of those permits are the most difficult ones to get and typically has been a multi, multi-year process to get to resolution with it. And lastly, we have Route 8, which is the preferred route, which is along Lafayette Street, down to Bassett, um, and then down to Duane, and you can see it in blue, and we're gonna spend our time today talking about Route 8. So Route 8 spans about 2.24 miles, and you know, we're, we're engineers, right, so we always get 2.24, now 2.25, 2.24 exactly. at this point. That might change. Uh, uh, we, we're gonna break it up into two segments. Uh, the northern segment that we call it, which is NRS2 Agnew, which is 0.74 miles, and that one, we looked at it both in overhead and underground uh, options, and goes down Lafayette Street, and then from Agnew to KRS, which we'll refer to as the southern segment, which is about one and a half miles, uh, that replaces existing transmission line where available. For that segment, we only looked at overhead alignment, and it follows once again, continues down Lafayette, then goes down Bassett and Duane Avenue. You can see in the picture kind of with the alignment that it follows. So the northern segment, um, as I mentioned, it would start off in Lafayette. And we, what we're looking at doing is using the center median of Lafayette Street. I do wanna note, and you can see from the picture, one, that there is no existing overhead currently in that section of road. And two, that you have residential development on both sides of the street, although you, you have you know, some separation in some cases from that development, but you do have residential development. So because of that, we studied both underground and, and overhead just to see what the options could be. So for the overhead northern segment, uh, you can see a kind of visual representation, pretty high level, but it, it shows you what the alignment would be on that median. It would be consist of nine new poles uh, within the median. Uh, they would be spaced on an average you know, 350 feet apart, uh, 90 to 125 feet in height. A uh, key component for us on the overhead alignment is that obviously going to the median is located within existing right-of-way or easements. So it's a significant positive. Um, the cost is approximately nine and a half million. And because of its location, it does have minimal utility relocation. There are some utilities that we have to be relocated based on where pole placements are looking at, but it's pretty minimal. Uh, we also do have discussed that we wanna minimize any landscape or tree removal, and we think we can do that in most cases. And a key component about overhead that we'll talk a little more in depth about is that an overhead transmission line can deliver more power than underground. In addition to that, because it's overhead, we are coming up with a design that can also accommodate additional growth in the future. So as I mentioned, most, most if not all of the initial use for this will be to accommodate you know, under construction or entitled projects or you know, master plan projects that we have in the city. But as I committed to the council, either this year or next year, we'll start having a discussion about whether we can accommodate additional growth beyond that. And you know, there's definitely people interested in coming to Santa Clara. Um, this would give us flexibility to do that. So for the under and northern segment, uh, what we have uh, ran into is that there are some constraints that are significant. There's constructability constraints, schedule constraints, power deliberately concerns, constraints, and while there's aesthetic issues on both, I, I want, do wanna let you know that aesthetics um, also apply to the underground, underground alternative with, and, and we'll go through that as well. So it's not just, aesthetics are not just an overhead item. So the, don't intend you to read the list, but on the Lafayette corridor, we have 25 existing utilities, 25, that are different locations within that corridor and many of those conflict with a possible underground alignment. <coughs> so it's a very, very busy corridor. 
including in those utilities, are three transmission gas lines, one for DVR, our power plant, and also one for PG&E. And beyond constructability, that a significant schedule issue for us. For DVR, we have to relocate that gas line for a period of time. Uh, we have to shut it down to relocate it. And we can only shut down DVR during specific times of the year, usually around March and around November. And we usually only shut it down for about two times, a, two weeks, a, two weeks uh, at a time, unless we're doing major, major maintenance, then we'll do a month. So if we wanted to do that, we would have to time everything perfectly to make sure the construction aligns with that gas line relocation. In addition to that, there's a PG&E transmission line that also would have to be a section of it would also have to be relocated. And that would mean working with PG&E, getting the permits with PG&E, and trying to time that um, with the project. And from a schedule perspective, um, I can tell you now, it will, we will not meet 2028 uh, if we have to coordinate a transmission gas line relocation with PG&E. Just based on my experience, based on early, early discussions with PG&E, we're looking at a longer time period. Can it be done? Yes, it's just, it's just a, a timing and, and uh, constructability issue. The next part with constructability is that there are some locations where we have to cross those utility lines as you go down the middle of the road because the utility lines actually you know, are not just this way, but they're also, they're also, um, they're also angled at the road. And there's a specific uh, location where we have to cross multiple lines and what the engineering team has looked at is, can we weave our new transmission line in between those utility lines? Um, preliminarily, there's a possibility we could do that at around 12 feet deep, but it also looks like there's a lot of conflicts there and there's a possibility we might not meet minimum spacing requirements. If that's not possible, then what the line will have to go, do is go about 20 feet deep to be able to get under those utilities. So these are significant constructability and schedule concerns. So on the underground, besides those items, right, that from my pure project management perspective and, and project delivery, uh, uh, you know, always focus on, on schedule, constructability, and, and funding, those are significant items. We also have a, a power delivery constraint that's typical for all underground projects, that if you are going underground uh, because of heat dissipation, the same size line, 115 kV or 230 kV, is not gonna deliver the same amount of power. It's gonna deliver about 20% less power. So that's a future consideration when you're looking at growth, that that will accommodate, accommodate less growth in the future. The exact number, I can't figure that out now, but it's definitely gonna be less. And lastly, just wanna highlight aesthetics. Certainly we would have nine poles on, uh, along Lafayette with the overhead alignment. But I do want to note that with the underground alignment, we have to have, and I, I talked to you about before, about riser poles, where the line comes in, goes underground, and pops back up. We will have to have two riser poles. One, um, right, you know, where NRS is at, we have the SFPUC easement, so it'd actually be overhead, get past the easement, connect to a riser pole that looks similar to that, go underground, and right before Agnew, line would pop back up, have another riser pole, and then head down the path. The approximate cost for the underground segment, it is more expensive. I would say that's not significantly more expensive in context of our overall budget, but certainly more expensive from a million's perspective. It's about $19 million. I do want to note, though, that does not include any PG&E relocation costs. We don't know what those costs would be. So then back to the overhead. From a summary discussion, I think the key components for us is one is that we control the schedule for the overhead. Um, based on everything we have today, we believe we can meet that 2028 energization date because we don't have to have those gas line relocations or work around the DVR shutdown. Um, it does create future additional growth if the council chooses to have growth beyond all that stuff that is already approved or entitled. Uh, it can accommodate more power, right? So it gives us more flexibility from that perspective. And I think a key note that I wanna make sure it's, it's clear as well is that when you look at the design to the right, um, what we're proposing to currently build is the top half of the facility. So it will be a constructed at 230 kV, but it will be energized at 115 kV, meaning that in the future, we can accommodate more power just with the top. In addition to that, we'll have the bottom half of the poles, which 
can accommodate a future 115 kV in the future in the, in the, in the proposed alignment. So that's a, a significant perspective of if the council does have kind of policy discussions and wants to accommodate future growth, that's gonna give us that flexibility. Lastly, we talked about the cost. And you know, from a maintenance perspective, obviously if there is an issue, when it's something's overhead, it's much easier for us to figure out what the issue is and repair it as needed. So a, a brief summary, I went through most of this again, I'm not gonna repeat myself. They, that gives you kind of where we're at. Uh, schedule, capacity, future growth. Uh, new, a couple of, uh, one more item in there is that, uh, you know, the overhead does have uh, less uh, disruption to the community during construction, just because of the, the road and everything else related to it. But I think I've gone through all this information with you and at this hour I won't repeat and go through the items again. So that was for the northern segment. On the southern segment, um, we, did, we decided that we wanted to continue with an aerial because there's already a number of transmission lines. So you see the picture right in, uh, on, this, on the screen. You can see that we have an existing transmission line both on the east side of the street, on the west side of the street. So I do want to note, from a pure engineering design perspective, our first thought was let's just continue with the line down the Lafayette median from Agnew to Montague, just as we were up north. Uh, it's easier construction, there's less easements, uh, also gives the same opportunities for additional growth in the future. But at the end, uh, we, are not, we will not be recommending that for really aesthetic reasons. We had some concerns about having three transmission lines on the same corridor. So what we, because we have the two existing 60 KVs on the east side of Lafayette and the west side of Bassett, what we are proposing to do is to actually um, replace uh, whichever side we're on, replace the existing transmission line with a new transmission line, which of course is lar larger. So between Agnew and Montague, the existing 60 kV is on the east side of Lafayette and west side of Bassett, that would be replaced. Uh, Montague Expressway, you would continue on the west side of Bassett Street and replace around 1,100 feet of 60 kV. And then I do wanna note that we installed uh, 2,980 feet of new overhead, but we are replacing uh, some, uh, some, other, some other poles uh, along that corridor, some distribution equipment. And then the final 980 feet of transmission line um, north of Bayshore to KRS would also replace a 60 kV. So uh, trying to take into consideration aesthetics, existing transmissions, we thought the rest of the corridor, uh, let's replace those existing ones with larger ones that also can accommodate uh, additional power. And in the future, obviously we always have the option of the other transmission line on the other side, if we want to do more growth, and the median option still available if we if we actually need it at that point. So, in summary, for the south of Agnew segment, uh, we're looking at about one and a half miles of overhead lines uh, with the pole heights um, shown there. Those are conservative. Uh, we'll see how those change. And I did want to note uh, the number of easements for each one. We're not we would not be required to get any residential easements. They would all be non-residential easements. And on the right, you see how many poles are installed, how many poles are removed. So for the, in the first segment, it's seven to 10. For the next segment, it's 11 and 13, although I do wanna note that some of those poles are, trend, are distribution, right, which are much smaller. And then the final segment is seven and five. So it's, uh, it's uh, from a pure pole perspective, uh, it's kind of, we're almost trading uh, poles. It's not too many, it's not an addition of very many poles uh, for that entire southern segment. So next steps. So where we're at is we're gonna continue developing the overhead design. We know we're developing at risk. Ultimately, the council will make the decision, but we are trying to make the, the 2028 date. Uh, and you know it's a lot of pressure for us to get there. Um, with the 230 kV primary and 115 kV future underbuilt. So we're gonna design it so we can accommodate that much more power in the future, but we are gonna, the plan is to energize at 115 when it's first in place. Uh, we will be doing our CEQA. Part of the CEQA is community outreach. So we'll be doing community outreach to the, to the neighborhoods and the, and the properties that are along the corridor. Uh, the plan will be to come back to you in fall 2024 with the CEQA, which we expect to be an MND. And then you know, after that, depending on the council determination, we'll of course start doing our equipment specs and starting with those long lead items. We're always in front of you with long lead items. And I do wanna note, that uh, Eastman discussions, uh, you know, I think we, we had 
a lot with a couple of projects in the last few years. Those will start uh, in the next few months to start that process. Um, and you know, ultimately in 2026, we're looking at a contract award to start construction. Uh, but at this point, all informational, some of this information subject to change. No decision can be made until we uh, have a CEQA document with, uh, with the MND in front of you and ultimately for the council to make that determination. So I think that concludes my whole presentation. We're, of course, available for any questions. Um, thank you very much. That was a very um, detailed report. I, I really liked it because it gave me a really good idea of what we're talking about. So thank you. It was very understandable. Councilmember Jane. Yeah, so, um, you know, you're proposing these new towers, which at the top could be 230 kV, and at the bottom could be 115 kV. Um, but if you did that, that transmission line system for south of Agnew, for north of Agnew, if you did underground, right, right now you're proposing 115 volt, 115 kV for the underground, but and you have a 20% loss due to thermal of underground, but you could do that at 230 kV and still have plenty of capacity if you just started with that underground at 230 kV. But my question is, when you go to 2,000 megawatts, what is the transmission line system gonna look like? Are you gonna have to keep adding more lines and do we somehow want a future proof uh, for, I don't really don't like the idea of adding a third transmission line system. As I drive down Lafayette now by Home Depot, I kind of regret that we put all of those overhead transmission lines there. Because when we go to 2000 megawatts, the city's gonna be crisscrossed with overhead transmission lines. Um, I'm not, I've, I've mentioned this before, I'm not happy. I really like the idea that we're gonna support the expansion and support businesses with 2,000 megawatts, but I just don't like all those overhead transmissions. So my question is, when you go, when you have to reroute the gas line for DVR, can you do that in advance, like in March when, you know, the you don't need DVR, uh, can you put in conduits and do all the prep work so that you can just pull the line through later and not have to, and then you're flexible with your timing as to when, it, when you wanna run that, that line. So, but I guess fundamentally what I'm asking is if the south, south of Agnew, you're gonna have 230 kV and 115, how are you gonna support that on the north side if you did underground. Um, it seems like it would be impossible to support it. Um, and, and I'm not happy about adding the above ground transmission nor north of Agnew. So those are my questions, thank you. Councilmember Hardy. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna disagree with you. <laughs> I think from a cost point of view, from a maintenance reality and because of the extreme amount of infrastructure we have there. Um, I lived right there on Calle de Primavera. I think a transmission line down the middle would have not been a big deal in comparison to, of course, even when I lived there, we had the trucks still going up and down f to the landfill. But uh, the trains are really more annoying <laughs> and the airplanes over overhead. So I think from a reality point of view, from the cost and from the maintenance and recognizing, and you did a good job of showing us what the risers would look like on either side. Uh, when I went through the report, I think the risers are more aesthetically ugly, you know, not pleasing, I should say, in comparison. My one question is, 
Uh, you talk about easements for the south part, which, which I understand we don't want a third line. And I like how you said, you know, one way or the other, one side or the other. But the easements, because we already have lines there, and is it just new easements because of the pole placement is different? Because we already have lines there. That's why I wanted to understand um, talking about e new easements. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Watnabe. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so this is very interesting since it's my district, um, and that's where there's so much um, development going on right now. So uh, I understand the need for power. Um, I, I think it's a very um, unique way of. Uh, approaching the issue and uh, at the same time I understand uh, the concern about going underground and uh, you know encountering problems dealing with all, all the infrastructure that's already in place down there um, I, I guess uh, the, the thing that I, I wonder about is how it will look um, you know, I, I was trying to imagine looking at the pictures you provided, you know, trying to get an idea of, of just like all these lines going down Lafayette Street and how is that going to look? And then thinking about the traffic signals that are already in existence and how, uh, you know, the work around the, the traffic signals. Um, and, and then how, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how it would cross over once it goes, uh, under Montague and then down Bassett. Um, I, I, I think you talked about it, um, Director Pineda, but I, I was just not sure quite how that was going to happen um, to, to keep it all together, uh, to go from one side to the next on Lafayette Street. Uh, so I don't know if you could just run me through it again and when, uh, when you're answering the questions. And then finally, what kind of uh, community outreach would you be doing? in person, Zoom, everything, um, just what your plans are. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member Becker. I'm sorry, I mean Vice Mayor Becker. It's okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, so uh, yeah, um, Council Member Watnabe kind of just asked the question I wanted to know about community outreach. Um, you know, I understand um, the price effectiveness that Councilmember Hardy brought up, you know, I also see what Councilmember uh, Jane was talking about when he sees what's happening on Lafayette so far. I mean, I'm a little surprised as well. Um, when I see this, you know, someone made a joke to me recently about our, you know, with the power lines being put up, and they're saying, oh, it kind of looks like something, you know, out of a theme park. Well, now I see this, and I kind of look at it going, well, we could put bucket seats on, up on top and probably charge for, uh, for someone to ride on them. I'm just kidding about that. No, it to me, it just kind of creates a very instant reaction when I see it um, because it comes down to about our open space. I think that's kind of, we don't want to eliminate that, but I also know the needs for power, so I'm trying to figure out the way we can balance it. Um, again, you know, price effectiveness, I understand that, and cost, uh, but I also understand about our open space. That's where it gets back to the question that Councilmember Watanabe was asking about the community outreach and how far we will go in that community outreach and if notices will be given within the radius that they're supposed to be or they'll go beyond that. Um, just because I know that looking at this area right here, I mean, it's a pretty narrow area, yeah, it can accommodate it, but is it gonna create an eyesore that's gonna you know, degrade the community or degrade the neighborhood? So those are my questions and my concerns. Um, thank you. I, I have a question about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the availability of power, because I know that, you know, it's a, it's a big topic for us right now for business, future business, and, and what's going to happen <coughs> here in Silicon Valley and especially in Santa Clara. <clears throat> so when you talked about the overhead, I mean, <coughs> Excuse me. You really made a case for overhead, I think, um, in terms of, you know, more power, additional growth, being on schedule, you know, everything you talked about. But with uh, the addition of AI coming, artificial intelligence, and how that 
is gonna require the need for even more power than you know, what is traditionally available now for high tech, that's what's happening in the future. So if we're not able to meet that demand, what is that gonna do for us? So how important is it for our future business growth in the city, and especially Silicon Valley Power, uh, that we plan for the future, knowing that the future is going to be very power needy. I would say, are, if we do the underground with 20% possibly less power and we limit ourselves, uh, are we, you know, hurting ourselves for the future? Because that's what I'm looking at, and, and I know that's a very real issue right now for us that is just going to be, um, there's gonna be even you know, more of a desperate need for power. So, okay, when you're ready, Manuel. And thank you, I'm ready and I'm sure if I miss anything, you or the team will, will let me know because I, I could see him furiously taking notes as everybody was, was providing feedback. So I'll go down the line. So on the, uh, on the question about the 200 megawatts and what do we want for the future. And, and I wanna just discuss that as we talked, the current plan that we have in place and that we're designing to is not for 2,000 megawatts, right? I think what we have talked about and discussed with the team is we're trying to get to 12, 1,300 megawatts, which is almost doubling the size of the utility. Um, if you look at the new transmission line coming into the city, if you look at our projects, that's kind of, kind of where we're at. We have gotten engineering approval from you to look at some additional projects, but only engineering approval at that point, and we continue to work with the Kaiso. We did another recent submittal showing that we could have additional growth and whether we can maximize the existing transmission capacity more or whether new transmission would need to come to the city. So I, I, I just want to acknowledge that um, we don't currently have a plan in place for 2,000 megawatts. The plan that we have in place for 1,200 to 1,300, somewhere in that range, and that accommodates a lot of the projects that are already approved under construction, both residential, commercial, and industrial. Uh, as I told the council before, there's many more projects that want to come to the city that we currently don't have power that we can provide for them, and that would require both a CAISO, um, uh, projects or Kaiso improvements, as well as our improvements beyond what we're discussing today. Um, with regards to the plenty of capacity or the question of capacity, so what we are trying to do, right, if we do the underground, we can certainly do that, but that does provide less capacity now. Uh, if we do it to 30 kV, would that be sufficient? Yeah, you know, uh, likely I, I, we would take a look at kind of what that would do. Um, but if we do want to have those policy discussions, if the council is interested in doing more, at that point, that underground 230 kV would not be able to really likely support what we need. The underbuild that we're talking about by having those poles, that gives us a lot more flexibility than just having that power within one underground utility does. And that's really where you lose, you lose that flexibility before you're allowed to have those policy discussions of how much the council I think there's two ones, a policy discussion, how much the council wants to grow, and then the second discussion is how much can we really grow both from a physical perspective, from a Kaiser perspective, from a state perspective, and that's a 2024, 2025 discussion that we're gonna have with you. Regarding the gas line, uh, could we do uh, early uh, relocation work on the DVR gas line? Having explored that, uh, I think that could be an, an option, obviously that would have to be under a separate contract, and. I always get worried when you have large projects and you're doing um, pieces of a contract before you fully design the facility, especially if you're gonna be dealing with underground options because if you relocate and it's not quite what you expected, then there's a lot of risk both to the city, financially, on schedule. So um, could it be done? Uh, maybe. Would it be a concern that it's not, you know, it's not necessarily everything we need to do once you open up the full road and determine kind of what, what you need to do? Yes, and as a kind of Talk, talk a lot like a project manager, right, from someone who used to build large projects on a regular basis, um, I would be significantly concerned about going down, down that path. There was a few questions about the cost and, and a few other things. I, I do wanna note, right, that from my perspective, 
my biggest concern right now, it's uh, one of my biggest, is schedule, as I mentioned. And even if you did the DVR gas line, um, you still have to work to the PG&E gas line. And I can tell you now that without even uh, going through the process, we will not meet the 2028 deadline working with PG&E to relocate a, a main, a transmission line. Just, I worked with PG&E throughout my 27 year career. This is a transmission line relocation. Ali had initial conversations with PG&E. Um, their best case scenario schedules, which never work, um, still puts us outside that 2028 deadline. And, and I wouldn't say deadline, deadline in time. And what, I mean, what that means is the, the projects that uh, would be loading, adding ramp to the city, we cannot accommodate those schedules. We're shooting for that 2028, because that aligns with NRS, KRS, SRS, and the new LS power transmission line. So if all those projects get built, and this doesn't get built, and it gets pushed out to 2031, 2032, even though we have built those other projects, we'll be limited to about 820 megawatts. So schedule is a significant decision point for me when, when um, um, as a team, we're recommending uh, the overhead, uh, and that and, and also the flexibility for power in the future to give you that flexibility that otherwise you won't have when you're making those policy decisions. On the easements for the south, the reason why we, we are going down existing alignments, and if I can have the presentation, I'm gonna need the presentation back. Uh, we need additional easements because the poles are gonna be taller, equipment's gonna st st go out farther, so basically you need to go farther into properties, typically with aerial easements, to accommodate um, the equipment and the swing uh, of, the, of, the, um, of, of the line. So that's typically why you need those easements. Uh, don't know for sure, I, I assume in some locations for pole construction, like we did on South Loop, you know, that would be affected as well, but I don't have that level of detail right now. Um, the question of how will it, how will it look, uh, obviously we don't have, let me see if I can, not going, oh, there we go. This is not the best picture, right? But this is, this kind of shows you what the northern segment would look like. So you can see, the new transmission line down the middle of the street would be approximately nine new poles. Uh, at this point, it only has the top part built. Uh, we would not be building the bottom half of it as unless it's needed. It just gives us the flexibility to build that in the future. But that's kind of graphically what that section would look. And that's probably the, kind of, you know, the, with the presentation today, that's the best graphic we can provide for you. Um, there's a question about the alignment, and I need to go back on that one. So this is the actual alignment, and you can see where it goes from NRS, that goes to the median on Lafayette. Uh, at Agnew, it will shift to the east side of the road, and we have the existing transmission line. And right, when it gets to, uh, I guess that's the uh, expressway, right? Montague Expressway we shift over to Bassett Street where we have another transmission line. So that's the alignment and that's where that occurs. So the, 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 the change from the east side to the west side happens right before the expressway and then, then you go over the expressway and continue down Bassett Street until you, you head down and eventually connect to KRS. So hopefully that provides a better picture of how the alignment is coming on the, the pipe. Regarding community outreach, uh, so we do have community outreach that will be coming up. We actually were discussing this morning, um, this morning or yesterday, a team can correct me, it might have been yesterday, about the, the community outreach related to the CEQA. And really our goal will be, uh, that that's coming up next. We're looking at doing that in the next, starting that in the next couple of months as part of the CEQA process. And really we, we're gonna talk to uh, not just the adjacent property owners, because obviously in Lafayette, you know, there's property owners that we're actually touching where we're gonna need easements from, and we definitely wanna have that conversation with. But on Lafayette, we definitely wanna talk to the adjacent residential neighborhoods so they can provide their feedback. Uh, at this point, we're anticipating to have a Zoom community meeting. Certainly we're open to hearing from the council if, if they have perspectives on community meetings and, and outreach and, and kind of what we're gonna do. We're, we're looking at one, outreach meeting, and depending on the feedback we get, we discuss the possibility of having a, a second outreach meeting, but for now, we were focused on having one outreach meeting for the project, wait to hear what we get back, and kind of go from there. 
Um, and then on the radius, um, of course, like I said, we are looking, we haven't finalized, but we do want to make sure that we um, also talk to both to neighbors, neighborhoods on both sides of Lafayette Street. I know on one side we have the, 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 uh, the railroad, right, next to it, but we still want to make sure we send those notices far enough out to make sure that everybody has opportunity to give us feedback as part of the process. We always like to make sure we get that feedback sooner rather than later. And then lastly, um, I think from a, a, med uh, a medium perspective, I think you were talking about open space. So one of our goals is to try to maintain every tree. The trees are not that tall at that location, so we think we have that flexibility. Uh, we probably will lose some landscaping where some of the poles will go, but um, the direction kind of we have taken on ourselves is that we're gonna maintain as much landscape as possible on the median island as part of this process and try to not remove any trees if possible. I don't know for sure how much will it be. So, so just as a, as a note, um, at this point, uh, really my, my biggest concern and, and the reason for the recommendation that I think we're gonna bring for you with an aerial overhead is, is really the, the schedule constraints. Um, I don't see how we get to 2028 with an underground alternative. Um, can it be built? I mean, I'm always a big, you heard me say before, I think anything can be built, but I try to be realistic and I don't wanna give you information. I, I think we'll be, not just a year out, but a few years out uh, before the line's done if we go with something that requires the relocation of a PG&E main line. And uh, the idea of building something that might end up being 20 feet underground does concern me. Um, just because once you get that deep in the utilities, there will, there will be things we just won't be able to, no matter how much engineering we do, there's things we won't be able to anticipate. And of course, you know, there's the constructability, money, and everything else. But uh, I want to make sure that, this get, that you know that the schedule, that 2028 date, I, I don't see us uh, really meeting that date and being able to accommodate the load growth that we anticipate within that time frame. So I think I got all the questions, unless the team, yep, yeah, and you can tell right, me as any well. Any other comments before we note and file this? Council Member Jane? Yeah. And it is a, excuse me, it is a note and file, right? City Manager Attorney? Yes. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Jane. It's, it's really sad that working with pg and is that hard. Um, <laughs> now, I mean, to avoid even having to deal with pg and &E, we could go 20 feet down. How, I know you said it scares you. No, no can How I, just common call, is it? Those are two separate issues. Okay. So no matter what, we have to relocate the two main lines for DVR yeah. and pg and &E, those yeah, no, transmission lines. The issue of going 20 feet deep is actually once there's a, there's a conflict point where a number of utilities are uh, perpendicular to the street instead of parallel, so then that line has to go either in between all those utilities, which if we can thread the needle, it would be about 12 feet deep. And anybody can correct me here. But if we can thread the needle, which you know, just based on experience, the idea of threading the needle, then you'll have to go 20 feet deep. Two separate items. Uh, under, under all the scenarios we have right now, both DVR um, transmission line, pg and &E transmission line would have to be relocated for 300 feet each approximately. So there is no way to avoid <coughs> relocating pg, PG Our current designs, uh, because the way Lafayette's, Lafayette, you know, with 25 utilities, mm. um, there's just too many conflicts. Uh, the current design that the engineers came up with you know, we could always go back and explore different options, but the current designs require both relocations of, of those, those facilities. Okay, and then my second question is, does the south um, section have to be so tall? Is it only that tall because you're accommodating both 230 and 115? Could you actually put 230 lower? So that, that one is the, what we're going to be accommodating on that. It's still going to be able to do design for 230, yeah. right? We're going to energize it at 115. But now what we're doing on the bottom part is we're accommodating the existing 65 kV. So because we're replacing a 65, that's going to go on the bottom. The oh. new one's going to go on top. I would not recommend at that point trying to save a little height to limit yourself to being going from 115 to, to, to increasing see. that 115 in the future, because we're already using that underside to, to, uh, to uh, put back the 60 kV that we are replacing. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. Motion, Vice Mayor Becker. Yes, motion to note and file. 
there a second? Second. Motion by Vice Mayor Becker, second by Council Member Hardy, City Clerk. And thank you very much for this report. It was really, really very detailed and good. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I just want to acknowledge the team, you know, You've here got and also our a, consultants. A, a. You got an A plus team. They, there. Yeah, they, they've been doing <laughs> a great, great work under a lot of pressure. It was so, a lot of work. In too. a difficult, very difficult, yes. difficult project. And we can see that. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, and that passes. So, oh, we have one abstention, I forgot. So six of us here on the dais. Thank you very much. All right, that leads us to uh, reports of members and special committees. Does anybody have any short reports? Council uh, Vice Mayor Becker, followed by Jane, followed by Park. Short reports, please. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, apologies um, for not getting this out of last meeting. Um, I know uh, the next couple weeks I won't be able to get these reports out. Uh, but on our recent uh, Caltrain L LPGMG, it's a tongue twister, uh, group, uh, we had two workshops, one in Mountain View at the Mountain View City Hall in the end of November and one in the Redwood City uh, uh, Council Chambers last week, March 14th. Um, what we did was between those two workshops, you know, it's a good time to talk about it now because between those two workshops is we were basically coming up with the L LPMG's role uh, what we're what what the goal of this committee is in the Caltrain electric not only Cal, Caltrain electrification project, but it's looking at establishing guideline guiding principles that are endorsed by each of the cities, which then in turn empowers the L, LPG, LPMG members to endorse program initiatives, um, like for examples uh, funding. We need to have, find ways to have funding dollars that are and with timeline guidelines. They're collective, coordinated, and bigger than the sum of the parts. Uh, we need to have a communicated path, uh, basically priorities. So in, an example of is supporting each other. So if Burlingame has a priority to create uh, a grade separation, which is the, sorry, the topic of all this is about the grade separation project. And if, the, if it's to have a priority for Burlingame to have it, but Santa Clara, we don't have any needs for those, maybe some luxuries later on down the road, well, we should be over there to be able to support Burlingame and say we, we agree with them, we want to support them and see them get their grade separation and not be a fork in the road uh, to their plans. So it's all about you know basically supporting each other and got each other's backs. Uh, we also have predictability. Uh, the timeline of the project and the progress uh, goal lines and uh, also balancing the train service and the, the uh, many of the transportation needs uh, modeling the future changes as well as community community awareness and confidence in taking on this project basically giving the reason why we need to do this um, it comes also down to uh, accountability uh, and that's one of the roles that we were discussing about accountability which was staff's uh, uh, central role as well as public the facing materials and looking at what the role of the committee is through its city representation and the empowering its members and how we do that in the success is by public communication and city council education. So for example, I've emphasized that maybe they should have members from this, from the Caltrain group come in to educate my council colleagues as well as all the other council colleagues in the cities. And they said, oh, that might be a lot of work, but actually a lot of people agreed to that because if I'm no longer in my role, let's say a few years from now, or another person's no longer in their role a few years from now, we wanna be able to continue that success by making sure that they know what this project's about or they know what this group is all about. So it's about, I guess, the communication and making sure people have the education. Clear policy benchmarks and project milestones, relaying that message and just demonstrating a, a progress on the project. Uh, basically saying, hey, we made it this far, let's move a little f further. Uh, and very clear lists of priority projects, uh, including the funding streams, and also communicating the safety benefits and improvements from traffic uh, accidents and fatalities. I know that's one of the biggest issues about the corridor. And lastly uh, is about the Stevens Creek Corridor Committee that I've uh, been on. Uh, it's been a very busy year so far, what we've been doing. Uh, we had a tour uh, about a uh, month ago, uh, right before the Super Bowl, 
Uh, and the tour uh, basically started, thank you to VAT, VTA for getting us a bus. It started at Dearden Station and it took us from West Carlos Street at Race in the Urban Village to Valley Fair, Santana Row in Winchester, Lawrence Expressway, Deanda College, and then we returned back to the Dearden Station. A lot of the highlights that we discuss is land use evaluation, the safety challenges of the mitigation and how we're going to make this a very, um, I guess, uh, inclusive area, not only for cars, but transportation. Um, the discussion highlights included maintenance concerns and anywhere from noise disturbances affecting nearby residents, parking in the neighborhood, especially during Christmas in the Santa Clara areas near Valley Fair, um, improvements to Lawrence Expressway's off ramps, mitigating employee parking overflow onto residential streets. I know that's one of Kirk Vartan's issues that he brought to our city council. Um, and that was something we talked a lot about uh, because they're looking at maybe taking away parking on Stevens Creek, which might create another effect. Um, it, it, we looked at infrastructure enhancements, which looked at Stevens Creek and San Tomas signal cord corridor, um, including college, we looked at college representation from De Anza because they're gonna be an area that's involved in the process. Um, and then basically, if you've missed a lot of these informational things, I suggest you go to uh, the website, which is known as, let me pull it up right here, just so I don't lose it, which is at uh, Stevens Creek Corridor, stevenscreekvision.com. Uh, on this website, you can browse all the past meetings and workshops, including the corridor tour that we just had. Um, and the next meeting will be on Friday, May 11th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at San Jose City Hall. I encourage everybody in the neighborhood of District 6 or Santa Clara that deals with Stevens Creek Corridor, please attend this meeting uh, because we need a lot of uh, 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 direction on where we should take this corridor and what the, uh, what the needs are and the direction and the mission statement. So thank you, Mayor, and I will have a further report at our next meeting. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands, so you did not have your hand up. Now you do. Go ahead. So I'm going to let, we didn't have reports from council members last week. I'm going to let Karen talk about robo-apocalypse. Um, but last week I attended the Civic Well Policymakers Conference uh, along with uh, Supervisor Otto Lee. Uh, Campbell Council Member Sergio Lopez and Gilroy Council Member Zach Hilton and probably about 150 other electeds. Um, I spent a lot of time with the five board members from SMUD and uh, as you know, SMUD has a very aggressive decarbonization plan. They're planning to be zero carbon by 2030. They actually developed a mobility center where low income folks can go and they can rent electric vehicles for free and they have a workforce development to train people on how to build EV infrastructure. So um, uh, then the other thing was that uh, there was a report from Beth Vaughn, CEO of Cal CCAs. So um, there's now 25 CCAs in California serving one third of California's population. Uh, and um, so there is uh, th an interesting, I met uh, Marilyn, who's the mayor from Alameda, and they have a basic income program that's very successful, $1,000 a month, and she referenced a movie called It's Basic. Um, she, she recommended that. Um, the uh, interesting thing is that uh, the uh, board president of SMUD actually sent people to the COP, the uh, Coalition of Parties, the UN Climates, Climate Conference, and they ended up in a group of utilities from different countries to sign a pledge. And most of those utilities from other countries were only targeting 80% carbon free by 2050. And SMUD said that they're doing 100% by 2030. And so she got all of these countries to sign this pledge and got so Cal Edison to also sign the pledge, which was good progress. So it's good to hear from what other people are doing. Um, that's it. And I think Karen has something to report. Council Member Park. Well, <clears throat> I did, I came back from the National League of Cities Conference in Washington, D.C. last week. <clears throat> we talked about a lot about minority engagement 
I went to APAMO, which is the Asian Pacific American Municipal Officials Group, and we talked about dealing with dog whistles and what they call strategic racism. Um, as minorities get large enough to disaggregate in certain um, certain instances, which, which is we want numbers, you put all minorities together and say minorities, and if you have numbers, you start to disaggregate, and you don't have just Asians, but you've got Vietnamese, Koreans, Japanese, etc. And this identity actually kind of robs minority of voice. Um, we talked about connecting children to nature, <clears throat> which is a program trying to ensure green in schools. And we realized that green is kind of a class issue, as only houses have large backyards, which is why public open spaces are very important as we build higher density, uh, especially you know, low-income uh, housing where we want children to also have a connection with nature. And I wanted to note that um, you know, good robotics teams going to Houston, and I don't know what Councilmember Hardy has to say about that. Turn it over to Council. Apparently something, Councilmember Hardy. I will just make an announcement. 10 years ago, Suds and I started uh, Wilcox Robotics, and we just got notice this past week that the Wilcox Robotics team and one of the teams from Santa Clara High are one of the only 150 teams in the world out of more than 5,000 teams that have been invited to the World Championship in April in Houston. So they will be um, showing off and uh, everything will have Santa Clara's name on it, two teams, and they were, the plan is to do a documentary which they'd love to show off when they get back. Thank you, congratulations to them. All right, um, this leads us, oh, city manager, executive director report. No report. Thank you, city manager. Uh, which leads us to our adjournment, and just want to say that um, the first adjournment we have this evening is in memory of Jennifer Sparacino, one of the three we have this evening, and uh, earlier we had our former assistant city manager, Carol McCarthy, who is still here, who has waited out. I don't know if you want to say something, Carol. Did you want to? You're okay? But... Uh, Carol was here along with um, our longtime city clerk, Judy Boccianoni, for those of you in the community that remember Carol and Judy. They were both very involved in the, in the community and uh, worked alongside Jennifer Sparacino. So um, tonight I'm going to ask the council that we adjourn this evening's meeting in memory of Jennifer Sparacino, Elise Marcelli, and Spike Standifer, all three longtime Santa Clara residents involved in the community. Uh, former city manager Jennifer Spiracino passed away on March 18th, 2024. Jennifer was born in Hood River, Oregon. She graduated from San Jose State University with a bachelor's degree in social work and a master's degree in sociology. Over her 37-year career with the city, including 25 years as city manager, Jennifer led numerous public projects and built a collaborative, community-minded culture within our organization. Her legacy includes her work ethic, which was unbelievable, <laughs> her integrity, and her principled public service to the city of Santa Clara. Jennifer is survived by her daughter, Bricken, and her family, including her siblings, nieces, and nephews. She is predeceased by her loving husband of 45 years, Thomas Peter Sparacino. Her loss is felt throughout the community, and we will let the community know when we do have the services, um, when we know when they will be for her. I know um, Carol McCarthy will let us know. Thank you, Ken. thank you, Carol. Uh, for being here this evening. It, it means a lot to us, our community, and her family, so thank you so much. I'd also like the, uh, to ask the council that we adjourn in the memory of Elise Marcelli, 
Elise Marcelli passed away peacefully on Tuesday, March 5th. She was born in McLeod, California and graduated from McLeod High School in 1947. She married the love of her life, Larry Marcelli, who was a former council member here and actually served with my father way back in the day. Uh, she married Larry on October 9th, 1949. They raised three children and remained in the same home in Santa Clara for 74 years. Elise was very involved in the Italian Catholic Federation, YLI, and Sarah International organizations. Her giving spirit inspired all who knew her. And I have to say, Elise, along with B. Cunha, who is still alive and will be, I think, 100 this year, they were the, the power and the strength behind the Parade of Champions that happened, um, that their husbands organized all these years. And Elise, till the end of her time, would come to the parades, including the current ones, to watch uh, and, and celebrate with our community. Elise is survived by her two daughters, eight grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. We offer her family and loved ones our thoughts and prayers, and it was in the, um, the Mercury News today. Her services are this coming up Thursday night at Lima, I think from 6 to 8, and Friday at 12.30 at St. Clair Church for those who would like to attend. Uh, next, we have J. Spike Standifer. Spike Standifer, as we knew him, passed away earlier this month. Spike was highly involved in his community. He served as commissioner on the Historical and Landmarks Commission from 2013 to 2021. His fellow commissioners remember him as a powerful voice for historic preservation. And I can attest to this, a lively sense of humor alongside his passionate community advocacy. In addition to his city service, he was very engaged with Santa Clara University and served as a docent at the Santa Clara University De Sassay Museum. Spike was married for over 50 years to his loving wife, Maureen. Spike leaves behind a devoted family and a wide circle of friends. He will be deeply missed. So I ask the council Here. that we adjourn in honor of these three very, very special Santa Clarence. Mayor. So I just wanted to say that um, the services for Spike will be tomorrow morning at St. Martin of Tours Church uh, at 200 O'Connor Drive. Um, the viewing will be at 1015. The rosary will be at 1045, and the mass will be at 11 a.m. Thank you. Is that also a motion to adjourn in the yes. memory? Okay. Second. So we have a motion and a second to adjourn. You're ready, city clerk. Please register your vote. <laughs>